Uh, so the GM's still busy reading Daggerheart and watching videos about Daggerheart and thinking about Matt Mercer and his dreams, so he didn't prep anything. So uh, session's canceled, and also the GM might need therapy. But that's neither here nor there. Welcome back. As promised, we have arrived with the Daggerheart episode, which I'm surprise, sure... Surprise, motherfuckers. No, I mean, it wasn't a surprise, actually, at all. Because we told Don't Surprise, them. mother truckers. We literally... We literally told people. You already cursed. Week. We're already demonetized. What are you talking about? It's okay, because we're not monetized in the first place, so it's fine. You have to be monetized to be... We're not. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's the neat part. You don't. You have to be monetized to be demonetized. True. Uh, greetings. Shalom. Okay. Salutations. Uh, Guten Tag, I think? I don't remember what that one means. Uh... That's Hello. Good day. In good day. Good okay. Day. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I can't think of any more. Ohio. That's another one. Uh, I, I I was trying to think of what it is in Spanish. <laughs> I can't, I can't. Yeah. What is it in Spanish? Buenos dias. Ah, there we go. Buenos. <laughs> is Ohana. it bad? Is it bad that I was like, what is it in Spanish? And my brain went, hey, what you doing, Holmes? <laughs> Wow. <laughs> <laughs> my yeah, it's all fun and games, so you hit him with the orale. <laughs> <laughs> it was oh, good old. Orale. Orale. Might as well just hit him with the. I mean, this this is. that's Orale is a Mexican thing. We might as well hit him with the wepa while you're at it. <laughs> oh, my God. Wepa, just... it's, a, it's a Puerto Rican thing. Uh, uh, okay. It just beats like. Hey, yo, it's like friends. You just, you my, just say uh, it and then people will whip out back to you in the scene over there. I see. My manager, anytime it's someone like a, in our store gets a, uh, like a, you know, a card or uh, uh, does a really good sale, she'll just scream out, whip like on the walkie. Yeah. As loud yeah, as it's, it's like an, it's like an exclamation. It doesn't really like, it, it just, it, it's like bet in, in, in English. It just can mean anything. <laughs> <laughs> is is your uh, is your manager Puerto Rican, Matt? Yes, she is. Ah, mm -hmm. I see. Uh, Dominicans also use it, but mainly Puerto Rican thing. Mm -hmm. Anyway, none of that is neither here nor there. We're back. I am Josh. Matt is here. We're back. What? What? Isaiah is also here. What's popping? I was really waiting for you to say wepa. <laughs> no, not this time. <laughs> I feel I feel like that would have been the appropriate response. Uh, <laughs> all right, it's the Daggerheart episode. We're talking about Daggerheart. In case anyone doesn't know, because you I don't know live under a rock or something, or you have short term memory loss like Matt. Uh, oh. <laughs> Daggerheart is the new RPG. It is in beta. Uh, released by Darrington Press, and Darrington Press is Critical Role's publishing company. Now, just to be real clear about this, because a lot of people are going to be like, it's the Critical Role game. Y yes, but also no. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. yes, in the sense that Critical Role essentially backed and paid for it, but Darrington Press is its own company and its own business, and they've published a bunch of other stuff and also plan to help other games get published so yes it's associated with critical role but don't just think of it as the critical role rpg it's like the cast are not even designers on the game except for i think mercer and talison yeah. a little bit I was so, say, i believe talison also yeah but like they're not the lead designers the lead designer is spencer stark who also made mm -hmm. candela obscura so yeah uh, isn't it uh i thought it was ivan man norman no Maybe I Spencer is is critical to the development in some. I forget exactly what his title is, but Spencer Stark is he's like lead designer or producer or something like that. Hmm. Anyway, so yes, it's the game that just came out. Uh, no, it didn't come out. It's out in open beta, which of open course beta? means. As we're about to talk about it, everything we say, everything we say can and will be held against us. I mean, can and will everything may or may not change. Mm -hmm. I didn't do anything. I'm innocent. Oh, I, I just checked. Ivan Van Norman is the head of Darrington Press. Head of what? Head of Darrington Press. Ah, ah. OK, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, yeah, I'm pretty sure Spencer's the lead designer, I want to say. 
Yes, yes, he is. Uh, no. No. So yeah. It... Now my brain broke. Eh. Sick. Oof. Speaking of breaking brains, Josh. Where can the listeners find us? Oh, can they do? Say, is, is, this a, is this a mind break joke? Is this like I a, was really no. waiting for some kind of good segue out of you there, Matt. No, that no, was no, ha- no. hilariously disappointing. Yep. I need you to try way harder. No. But okay. Anyway, yes. It, I, I, before <laughs> we get into it, please hit the follow or subscribe button on your podcast platform of choice. If for no other reason than to follow so you can yell at Matt for his bad segues. You know? Uh, Because that was Mm -hmm. atrocious. Mm -hmm. Anyway. So, yes. Daggerheart. What the hell? What what is is game? Is new tabletop in open beta? What is going on here with game? I do not understand. Um, The best way that my read on this game is it is trying to be a game that sort of bridges the gap between D&D and powered by the apocalypse games a la apocalypse world dungeon world blades in the dark um oh by the way if you're anyone who's playing the sessions cancel drinking game just get a big bottle of something now don't bother with any cups just drink straight from the bottle because i'm going to be referencing apocalypse world a lot like a lot a lot because this game pulls from apocalypse world a lot a lot and and blades a lot, uh, which is, I suppose, not very surprising because Candela Obscura, a lot of people were like, this is just Blades of the Dark. And it it kind <laughs> of is. Yes. Uh, so Mr. Mr. Spencer Stark has a certain proclivity of which I am a fan of. So, yeah, if you're playing the drinking game, you're going to get absolutely hammered and uh, just just keep that bottle right next to you. Don't put the cap back on. Do not grab any glasses or nothing. It's not even worth it. Okay. Um, before we get into it, I just I'm curious, temperature check, gentlemen. How are we feeling about the game overall so far? Very broad strokes. Uh for me, I like it a lot. Uh, but it definitely has some clunkety bits and some bumps that I think either need to get worked out or removed completely. Um mm-hmm. But also, that's probably not very surprising because many of the touchstones of this game are games that I already really like. So, you know, of course I would like this game. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to give it uh, a solid I like it, but there is stuff that confuses or frustrates me. Yeah. Yeah, same. Like, give it a number score, like seven and a half. Uh, we do a f- Which, one for the we, record from a seven and a half for me is a pretty good score. I'm not even going to. We do a one to five scale, Isaiah. I'm just saying. Uh, Thank three God. And a half. Yeah. Yeah. Same three and a half. Still hate these damn halves. It's All fine. right. Three. It's fine. It's fine. See, you hate the halves, but you gave us a half in one of our uh, class handbook episodes. <laughs> so I return it to you I now. I gave the half and then retracted <laughs> the, and the half. half, though. I said I said I would, but I wouldn't. I retracted my half. I'm not retracting my half. Three and a half. <laughs> I, I very specifically explain. God damn it. I'm going to kill you. Yeah. Anyway. Who knows Who knows when the game first, uh, or I guess when this game fully comes out, you know, by the time. Is this going to be something I may or add to my collection of possible D&D replacements? Maybe. Big maybe. Capital I'm, M. Okay. Honestly, I, I'm not even really concerned about its official release. I just want to see its first editorial pass and see what that looks like. Okay, oh, yeah. I I I, um, I just want to I, I want to say two, two things real quick. First of all, let's be honest, Matt. You're probably not going to like this game this much that much. Also, uh, okay. Uh, why do you use the word replace? It doesn't have to replace anything. You could play more than one game, and they don't have to replace each other. It's not like you can well, only I ever say, play one <laughs> RPG ever. <laughs> like, well, oh, you're. You're kind of diving a little too deep into it. I didn't mean it as in like, I'm never going to play D&D ever again, and I'm only going to play Dagger Heart. No, it's it's mostly like, you know, well, the next system I try 
I guess I'll rephrase the, the wording. Dagger Heart is a big maybe in another system I am willing to play. Well, I, 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 I just say that because the word replace has a very specific connotation. That's why I was confused, because I feel like... But Josh, it's me. Don't I've look heard, too deep. It, uh, but, but but it means a very Stop. specific thing. I can't. It's what the word no. means. I can't Stop. just not. <laughs> no. It's what the word means. Just do the opposite. You could... you. It might be a game you add to your repertoire of games you play. Sure. That's not the same thing as replacing something. Because replacing implies... No, I'm, I'm actually with Josh here, because you, you, <laughs> when you say replace something and then go, don't look too far into it, it's like, it, there's nothing to look into. You literally said the word replace. Okay. Replace yeah, has I, very specific I, meaning. All right, yeah, I will change the wording I, instead I, of replace. I get what you mean now. Another game to add. Yeah, yeah. I get what you're saying. But, well, because it does... Don't you god us, sir. Yeah, I was going to yeah, say, I'm matters. Gonna god you guys. It you guys look too deep into the... No, <laughs> it matters. It's, it's you just can't, a word. You, like, there was no... There was no subtext there. It was just text. You said the word <laughs> it was replace. Just text. What? There was no subtext. It was only text, and the text was bold fonted. Still, it was, it was not. No, it was, it was un. It was not. It's not bold. It was just a word. Maldito sea la madre. Also, right. <laughs> I, also, you should be looking at other people on YouTube who have been specifically stating that it is actually going to replace in the phrase well, I think in some, which it is going to, they're going to stop playing d, &D. Yes, because I think some people mean Pathfinder. it. Pathfinder. That is not what I meant by it. Okay, but, but when you say more. that, I think you're saying what those people are saying. That's what I thought you meant. <laughs> no, if I had like malice in my voice or something, then maybe, but I don't, so. But, but, I, but there's only one, but Moving the word- on. I'm gonna fucking have an aneurysm. I I'm having I an aneurysm right <laughs> now. <laughs> there's only I, I, I one definition to the word you replace. Deep into this. Anyways, actually, before we even oh, begin, you're God. so lucky we're recording <laughs> right now. Good. I would be saying <laughs> some heinous things. <laughs> oh my God! Before we actually do do our oh, dive Christ. into Zagahar, Josh, I gotta uh -huh. I gotta ask you, yeah, because this is you. Uh huh. So out of all the D and D air quotes replacement underscore, just call them comma, fantasy heartbreakers. No. So that's what that out means. Of all these other new new 5e clones, five they're not, not clones, no, not 5e they're fan oh my God, games. Man. These new fantasy tabletop one word RPGs that oh are coming my out. God. Why specifically have you grown so? I guess because I haven't heard you talk about like because we've been you know talking before recording back and forth yes, about yes. Dagger and stuff. Yes, but this one specifically has kind of gotten you, you know really by the heart and has been like, ooh, like there's something with this one. Okay. I didn't hear you talk this passionately about the Tales of the Valiant Black uh -huh. uh, black Flag. I didn't hear you uh -huh. mention anything about the MCDM one coming out. Uh-huh. Uh, I think I'm the only one out of us who knows anything about Advanced 5e, which really is yeah, I just do not care about 5e that. with extra crunch. So, yeah. you know, what? It, or the other one to DC 20 that is basically mm -hmm. 5e with more homebrew question uh -huh, mark uh-huh uh-huh okay so why I, dagger heart i can why? give you a i can give you a step-by-step -step answer for each of them specifically <laughs> sure so uh yes I, so amongst the fantasy heartbreakers which for anyone who's listening is like what the fuck you on about mate fantasy heartbreakers are fantasy games in the style of DD &D that are sort of trying to dethrone D, D as it were and the reason they're called fantasy heartbreakers is because you release your big epic fantasy game and then your heart is broken because it doesn't dethrone D, &D and it doesn't become as popular as D, &D and then you're sad because you don't make any money and it doesn't become popular that's the heartbreak part anyway yes among the modern fantasy heartbreakers right now um so tales of the valiant I was excited and paying attention to when it was Black Flag and I was interested. Every subsequent bit of information I have gotten about Tales of the Valiant has made me less and less and less interested with every new release because the more I look at Tales of the Valiant, the more I just go, it's just 5e too. It's just more 5e. And that's not what I'm looking for. Uh, yeah, so yeah, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Every release of Tales of the Valiant, I have gotten actively less interested to the point where I now find that game just boring to even talk about. Um, also, the rollout of information on Tales of the Valiant hasn't been super fast, so I haven't been paying that much attention to it. Um, we also haven't gotten a big full PDF of the game like we did with Daggerheart, right? Like, Daggerheart, they gave us the whole last game. Like, this is not a snippet. This is the whole game. 
so that's part of it too. With the MCDM RPG, I am interested in the MCDM RPG and I am paying attention to it and I'm watching all the videos that Matt and James and Takasa are putting out talking about it. Um, I just can't get too excited yet because we as consumers haven't gotten anything tangible to get our hands on yet, unless you're part of the Patreon, which I am not. I was going to say, yeah. Uh, so unless you're part of their Patreon, which I think I, is like five bucks or eight bucks a month. Yeah. So I, I haven't had the material to get really attached to with the MCDM RPG. And mm-hmm. that game is changing so quickly and they're iterating so much that I'm not getting particularly attached to anything they say too much because it's going to land in an entirely different place really early on in the MCDM RPG's lifespan. uh, I mean, shit, that game don't even have a name yet. It's just the MCDM RPG. Um, Really early on in that game's lifespan, they talked about having a a chaos die, which was a thing that kind of sounded similar to like critical role, the dagger hearts, hope and fear die thing. And they just threw that out completely, you know? So like, I, I'm not getting particularly attached to that game because it's ebbing and flowing like crazy. I'm also not as interested in the heavy emphasis on the tactical thing. Like, I don't, I don't mind. Like, I like the tactic stuff, but I don't know. I'm a little iffy on if they're pulling it off in a way that I think is going to be fun or not. Again, I haven't played, obviously, so hard to say. Uh, the DC 20 game. I said it when you get when you linked that video forever ago, Matt, Uh, that game just screams. I'm a person who's only ever played D&D and I'm going to make a game that's kind of like D&D, but different. Uh, But because I've only played D&D, all of the things that I put in this game, I think are super original and cool and nobody's done them before. When in actuality, lots of tabletop games have done all the ideas that are in this game but I don't know those games exist, so I'm not paying attention to them. Uh, so I just looked at the designer talking about, I can't even remember the guy's name. He's, he's a D and D YouTuber. I know that, um, uh, the dungeon coach. Yes. So I looked at the dungeon coach talking about this game, about his game and him getting all excited about, and in this game, we do this in this game, we do that. And I'm just sitting there and going, okay, this other game also does that, but better. This game does that, but better. This game does that, but better. So I'm just not interested because, not for nothing it feels like baby's first game and homeboy thinks he's rewriting the bible and he's not you know uh now that does not to say it's going to be good or bad i'm just not interested because you know like look you can't i can't have a lot of faith in you as a designer if your if your spectrum of of experience is so small you know like if, if someone like if someone were saying to me, I'm designing this hot new video game and they've only ever played Nintendo games and then they think they're rewriting the entire video game landscape because they make a game like Call of Duty. It's like, oh, no, you're it's just because you're not. It's just because you're kind of uh, inexperienced, you know. So I'm just like kind of yeah. not. I just don't have a lot of faith in that particular one. Um, hmm. And then what was the last one? Those three what was the other one. What was the other game you just mentioned? Um, MCDM. Correct. MCDM. Oh, uh, oh, Advanced 5e, which is the... Oh, yeah. Uh, Advanced 5e is just because more 5e, and I just... Yeah, it's I, more 5e, I yeah. just, um, I'm good. I don't need I don't need 5e, but more crunchy. I, I just don't... Mm. I just... Go, I'm good. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, why I mean, did Daggerheart... It's called Pathfinder. Like... <laughs> yeah, and also we have Pathfinder. That's true. Um, So, like, why did Daggerheart latch on? I, I mean... I basically already gave you the answer, Matt, because Daggerheart takes from a bunch of other systems that I already like a lot. That's that's what it comes down to. Like it, it is it is a role playing game that conglomerates a bunch of systems from other games that I like already and then repackages them in a fun, colorful sort of high fantasy vibe. And I've kind of been looking for a new colorful, high fantasy, heroic game that isn't 5e and this game so this game is doing that and taking from games i already like so it's just a nice little perfect soup for me in particular Mm. yeah you know okay yeah because like you know you don't have to do something original to have something good you just need to bring all of your pieces together in a nice synthesis you know it's like why is it, it 
to give the video game comparison, is Helldivers doing anything new or exciting in the video game landscape? In terms of gameplay, absolutely nothing at all. But it's brought all of these pieces together in a really nice, elegant package. Uh, so Daggerheart is kind of looking like it has the potential to be that for me. And mm. particularly, I really wa- I, I have actually been looking for a game that has a, the play style of Dungeon World, but is m- meatier than Dungeon World, because Dungeon World, although I like it a lot, is kind of a skeleton not a skeleton it's a very it's trimmed it's a very trimmed down game there's not a lot to it once you've played it like twice you've kind of experienced the whole game so an expansion on the the style of play that dungeon world is is something i'm very interested in and daggerheart is pulling a lot of dungeon world influence very clearly i might add like they homeboys ain't even trying to hide it which is good i don't i hate when people try to pretend they're not trying to hide it at all it's very obvious stuff so yeah that was a long tangent (laughs) yeah isaiah any any philosophical questions you want to hit me with no no i i'm I'm just i'm actually quite excited just to get into the meat of it okay okay so let's get into the meat of it uh yeah so I, I just noted a couple of things that the game says before it even gets into the rules. I noted a couple of things down that I liked uh, the game touted asymmetrical design for the GMs and the players. Love that lots, because if you do it right, I think it works great. Uh, one of the things. I, I don't think you should design your game the same way on both sides of the screen because both sides of the screen are doing different jobs. So you shouldn't have the same kind of game. And something like D&D or Pathfinder tries to make both sides of the screen as similar as possible. And i not a fan. You know? Uh, so the idea of them specifically saying they're trying to avoid that, love that. Um, they also called out the Genesis system for the hope for the fear and hope mechanic, which I thought was really funny because the first time I heard and saw anything about the fear and hope mechanic, I immediately went, oh, that's kind of like fantasy flight Star Wars. And then they're like, we use the Genesis system for inspiration. I went, oh, yeah, well, that yeah, that checks out. (laughs) Mm-hmm. The Genesis system being the name of the dice system that the Fantasy Flight games use. I was use. about to say, we should probably specify yeah. that. <laughs> yes, it's called the Genesis system because they have a game called Genesis. That's like a sci-fi RPG. Um, but Genesis, Star Wars, uh, the Warhammer, Wrath and Glory game, like all of Fantasy Flight's tabletop games, as far as I'm aware, use that die system. Uh, so I was just I was just happy that I noticed that one. And then the other thing I thought was really funny is they called out that Blades of the Dark and Apocalypse World were inspirations for the character sheets. Uh, and before I even read that, I looked at the character sheets and went, this kind of looks like an Apocalypse World character sheet and kind of has the layout of a Blades character sheet. And then I read that and I went, oh, yeah. OK. <laughs> Which is this is what I mean when I say they're very upfront about their influences right it's very obvious yeah um oh and then i thought matt matt did you see the little mention of flea mortals yeah yeah, yeah I thought the that, monsters yeah i thought that was fun because i know both me me i think all three of us actually have brought up how Fori used to have the monster typing system and how yeah. there's a lot of cool things you could do with that and specifically says in Daggerheart, we took a lot of inspiration from the monster system in 4E. And I was like, let's fucking go. That um, that so. that Sly Flourish book I, I recently bought, the uh, Forge of Foes, yes. they bring that back and they're like, nice. how to do this in 5E and like like things you can add and tweak to monsters to make them more like a skirmisher or a leader or a solo type. And It's almost like it was a good idea or something. Crazy, right? Yeah, crazy, crazy. <laughs> Um, probably one of the hidden things Wizards has in the background they're like we didn't want to put this out there and it's like yeah, why yeah fucking right <laughs> um the game has no set world uh it takes a very dungeon world style approach to the setting which is sort of there's an implied setting via the existence of the classes and the race you know the ancestries and the equipment and all that stuff 
all of that stuff implies a style of setting, right? It's very clearly mm-hmm. a high fantasy kind of heroic setting with lots of different creatures and people running around. Uh, but it has no preordained setting. I like that. I know you two don't. <laughs> I was right. going to say, yes. So I I do like when a setting has lore that I can pull from. Yeah. Because it's less work for me to do. And don't get me wrong. Like, uh, I really like it when it, like when I get to design the setting with my DM or, or if I'm the DM, I like it when my players get to design the setting with me. I do enjoy that. But I also do really like having established lore that I can pull from and that I can, you know, mm-hmm. you can get as deep or shallow with it as you want just based on how much you're willing to, like, watch a couple of videos or, or read some wiki pages, you know? Yeah, I'd rather have the option there and then choose to not use it than just not have the option at all. Exactly, yeah. Well, it is worth pointing out that just because it's implied setting doesn't mean that lore information to pull from doesn't exist. Because that stuff will be there. It'll just be couched in, like, the ancestry descriptions. It'll be couched in monster descriptions, in, like, the types of equipment you have. Like, it'll be couched in different places, but it is there. It's not nothing, you know what I it mean? It is, it is, and but like I, I read through the the ancestry stuff. It it's pretty sparse. Like, you've got enough for like a a skeleton of a setting, and then you have to fill in a lot of the stuff yourself. I mean, yeah, like there's no explanation as to why the any of the races exist or their like origins or anything like. It's like they these things exist, and this is sort of their like physiological traits that that allow them to do something in this part of the world. Yeah. Really I mean, they could that, just though? make generic fantasy land again. Like they they could easily just do it. And then again, if you want to change it, you can. If you want to ignore it and build your own, because that is a thing a lot of dungeon masters do. They like building I mean, most D&D play. You know, it, it's homebrew. Most people like making their own world and playing it. So this is definitely going to appeal to a lot of people who do that. But yeah, no, me like me and Isaiah, we you know, I, I like I want the option there. I want I want to be able to I, choose to ignore it. I would actually go as far as say I, I I don't even really want generic fantasy land that I can break apart and mm. do stuff with. Because I am quite frankly very tired of generic fantasy land. Um Like I, I you know, we have this race in Daggerheart of like Galapagos turtles, right? Like these like this race of turtle people. Yeah. How we're like what part of the world are they from? It's called they're called Galapagos, so I'm assuming there's some they, they, like they're tropical or subtropical. You know, there's a bunch of different versions of them. Do they have like is there a turtle variant that had like oh, sorry, like a tortoise variant that have like a different name? You know, do, what are the different traits that you can expect from different parts of the world? That's the kind of the stuff that I'm really interested in. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if it's like, well, they exist, then you go why? And then they, the, the game looks at you and expects you to figure that out. It's like, well, yeah, I, I, I could. I, just I honestly think it is that me. one. <laughs> I think like much like me when I speak, it's not that deep. So I think it's I literally it's just like, yeah, it's a turtle person. Oh, do it's like, don't do this. You're not going to win this. You're not going to win this. <laughs> don't like, do it. It's like, oh, but it, it, it says Galapagos. So maybe there's like a tortoise person and then there's like a sea tortoise person. And it's just like, nope, just turtle. That's it. Just OK, turtle. but do you guys realize you just did? You just did the exact thing the game wants you to do in the five seconds of talking about it. Uh, yes, like I said, I can do it. Right. But like, I, 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 think I you, want it to be there to use. I think you're underselling your ability to just make that stuff work. Like, I don't I don't know. Like, do you really need an entire hundreds of wiki pages? You know, no, like, but like a no, like I said, don't don't need just want like yeah. <laughs> I'd see, I, I look that just hundreds of wiki pages to me just looks like boring homework. It is if the setting isn't like interesting, like mm. so perfect example, right? I'm reading through Lancer right now. I had full intent on just ignoring whatever Lancer's lore was <laughs> and making my own setting for it. I was going to do that because I was just like, I, I don't know. I it, it, I guess it may have come from some like conceited, like I know what I'm talking about. I'll like, but the game's lore is so good that like it's just going to be better than anything I have. Like, it's like so interesting and vast and well thought out that it's like, well, I, I, I could come up with something cool, but it would be like an active disservice to this settings like 
writing to not use it. You could also just build on it and add your own tweaks and See, send changes to it. Th- I kind of dis- I kind of disagree with your base premise there. Of I can't come up with something as interesting. I don't, I don't know why you would sell yourself short like that. Uh, I mean, I probably could come up with something as interesting, but the amount of depth that the game goes into is like stuff that even I wouldn't think about. I mean. Yeah, I guess, but I don't know. To me, having a big, thick setting just makes... Just looks like more homework. It just makes me go, eh. Especially because if I have to read through the setting and then I don't like the setting, then it's more homework and it's homework I didn't like. I mean, well, homework kind of implies you not liking it, but you know what I mean. Like, it's more homework and it's homework I just, I really hated, you know, like... It's just, just it, I suppose even if you don't like the set. So like I, I, I can totally see someone reading stuff about 40K and then being like, no, I don't like this. It's like too dark and grim and fucking everything sucks. But they're like, oh, but I really like the orcs. So I want to take the orcs and put them in something because they're really fun. <laughs> like, yeah, so there's a purpose to it. It's not just like well, now I have I can't do anything with the information I have now. I'm not saying I can't do anything with it, but I'm just saying if I'm reading through a tabletop game, and it's like, all right, here's this really dense lore that you need to understand for the game to like really work well. And then I read through it all and I just hate most of it. Like now I'm like, cool, I wasted a lot of time and now I'm probably tired and maybe not in, as invested in the game itself because the homework sort of killed my excitement, you know, like. Well, no, I, I, well again, the thing with me that me and sat with me, me and Matt said with the lore is you don't need it. Like we could come up, I could, I I was already thinking of like whole factions and stuff for running a game in Lancer, but now that I have the lore, but a lot of games, you kind of, I'm happy with it. it. That's the thing. There's a lot of games that the lore is so tied in that you kind of do need it to understand how the game functions. Like there will be like a good example is uh, blades in the dark is pretty intrinsically mechanically tied to its setting. You need to have at least some understanding of the setting as a GM, maybe not so much as a player, but as a GM, you need to have some understanding of the setting to be able to really like fully grasp what fully grasp the mechanics of the game. You know, not all games. There are games where you can ignore it, of course, but I've come across games there. That is not the case. So with a game that's already pretty free form by saying there's no preset setting it's just it's just it's just a big stress reliever you know uh, not for me it's the exact opposite <laughs> somebody wait a minute wait a minute so you like reading all this lore crap but you complain about reading the game i don't know boss because it's because that because lore, Sir, it's almost lore like, can be fun the, yeah see that the, the lore is the thing that i usually look about that's the shit i usually care about <laughs> Mechanic mechanics can sometimes feel like you know you're reading you're reading the phone book. Mechan- yeah, I mechanics think, like, I think reading, reading the mechanics are fun. Plus I like reading the game design. I think that's no. fun. You can sure, that's fair, that's fine. Well, now I feel like I'm being bullied. <laughs> How oh, are you being oh, fucking bullied? Matt, oh, Matt's oh, bullying me. No. me no. No. Say the word Matt's bullying me. me. That's bullying me. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I'm being yeah. me because you were being yeah. me. Yeah. I wasn't being me. I just said Anyways, I like I'm reading. Fucking, the I'm fucking me. I'm fucking <laughs> No, I mean, yeah, no, it's when just it comes different. to Daggerheart. Yeah. Oh, sorry, go, go for Isaac. Yeah. When it comes to Daggerheart, there, there's so much interesting stuff that they put on the table that I just wish that they had extrapolated. Yeah. I, I mean, will again, say it, I, they're going to add to it later on at the. Yeah, I was going to say, there probably will true. be more true. information in places like Ancestries and stuff like that, I would imagine. I don't think it'll be as sparse as the bit is, but you're not going to get 5e Volo's Guide to Monster type shit, I don't think. Now, Sag. do they release settings, st- setting material down the line? Probably. I think that's probably what they're going to... Uh, the idea is probably going to be like, the base game has no setting because here's the thing having no setting lowers the barrier of entry for a lot of people because you whether you agree with this or not you do have to understand that there is a there is a, a, a subset of people who will not get invested in a game if they feel like there's a massive deep heavy amount 
of like lore and story and information they need to know because like for example right if someone wanted to like get into the halo universe right now that's a daunting task right like but there might be someone who's like i'm not gonna play the halo games because there's so much supplementary stuff that relates to the halo lore or or i'm not gonna play a warhammer game that's probably a better example i'm not gonna play a warhammer game because of how much warhammer lore there is and people will look at that and go that's such an investment that i just don't have the time i'm just not gonna do it i'm just gonna tap out instead mm. so and again whether you agree with it or not it it, 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 it you know irregardless of, or doesn't matter in this case people will look at Daggerheart and go, oh, there's no setting, so there's not a shitload of information for me to have to learn up front. That makes the barrier to entry lower. And I think that's I, I get what why you're they're doing it. I, I, I do challenge you, D&D itself, having, be, being the biggest tabletop RPG and having an ass load of lore that is, by and large, completely fucking ignored. It 50 is. years of lore Here's that the thing, is mostly though. ignored. I've heard people say, I'm not going to get into D&D. There's too much lore. Like, I've heard people that statement be made or uh, not statement. I guess I should say I've seen that text be written on the Internet. I guess it's probably a proper way to put it. Yeah, like, sure. I've seen I, people I, literally say it doesn't exist it's too much. So I'm just not going to bother. Uh, look, I'm sure it exists. But when you look at like the numbers don't really lie. The game is massive. It's right. as big as it's ever been. But and I think most people either don't know or do not give a shit do about not, the world. Yeah. They're like, well, I'm making my own well, setting. Don't Why would know I is different. I, I, That's the thing. Well, I think a lot of people do get into the game because they don't know that shit exists. Yeah. Like a uh, good example, but my buddy Jake, who's like just getting into D and D he's been playing Pathfinder for a while, but just started playing DD within the last like two, three years, you know, slowly, but surely like every new player you start learning, you're like, Oh, there's lore. Oh, there's history. Oh, what's the difference between chromatic and metallic dragons? And bit by bit, you know, you learn that shit on your own. If you're interested, if you're not interested in it, then you just fucking ignore it like everybody else. No, I, I, I know. But what I'm saying is that a huge, a huge point, a huge part of the thing with D&D is I think you're right, Isaiah. I think a lot of people don't know that lore exists. And part of the reason they don't know that lore exists is because Wizards doesn't push it or try to make that lore central to any of the marketing even the player's handbook is very brief very light on any kind of the predefined setting stuff so it, it it's a marketing decision to sort of lower that barrier to entry and i think that's why daggerheart's doing it and i wouldn't be surprised if in the future they're gonna drop their own setting books that be like if you want to play dagger height in a specific setting here you go and i'm sure the first one will almost certainly be some kind of exandria thing you know because that has already put all that work in yeah i mean like look i will i uh, am i interested in running dagger heart a little bit yeah um but I, I probably would wait until i've got more information on like the setting before i'd want to run it you can't run a game just based on liking the game mechanics I can, but again, Daggerheart has such interesting ideas that they're presenting that I want to wait and see what they've got. Okay. Yes. Uh, what do I got next year? Um, oh, we should also probably we should have mentioned this in the be very, very, very beginning of the episode. We have not actually play tested. The oh yeah. Material. Ha. Yes. 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 We have not played Dagger. We haven't played it yet. Uh, we've, Soon re we've read through we've read through the book a bunch. I watched the I watched all the way through Critical Roles one shot. I watched their other supplementary videos. Um, I've watched some other people just like I've watched other people's videos talking about the game. But yeah. no, I haven't played it. None of us have played it yet. We're all getting it from so that this is not a good point, Matt. This is not a review. This is impressions. This yes, is impressions. We, made, we all have all made characters in the character creator. Though. We did make characters, but that doesn't, you know, that tells you a small amount of information, I would say. Uh, but yes, we have not played, so this is not a formal review. This is impressions. Uh, but 
I personally, I can't speak for these two. I have read very thoroughly and taken notes and all that fun shit. So it's a pretty thorough impression. Uh, I have not taken notes, but I have, I, I am, I have pretty thoroughly read the first half of the book and I've skimmed the rest knowing that we were going to make this a two-parter so I didn't have to know everything. I mean, I haven't gone through the entire thing yet either. Uh, yeah. I, I've just gone through I skimmed a most, lot. most of the book, flip, flipped around from random chapters to chapters. Anyway. Uh, yeah. Good, good, good disclaimer. And yes, Matt, I did intend to say that at the beginning and forgot. Um, no, I, I just kind of realized I'm like, oh shit, we never mentioned yeah. it. Uh, they have, so they have the six character traits. Uh, character traits are your stats. Uh, they are let me open it they are agility strength finesse instinct presence and knowledge uh con is not in there uh and was removed in favor of having finesse and agility um there's nothing particularly there's not much to say on the character traits they do the job they're fine it is a little weird that there is agility and finesse but i I kind of get it. So the description they give is that agility is for like sprinting, leaping and maneuvering. And finesse is for like fine motor control, hiding and tinkering with things. So it's like physical body agility versus like hand dexterity, I guess, is the idea of what finesse is. Yeah, yeah, that makes, I get that it. That makes sense. Yeah. It, also, rather than have everything on one stat like dexterity is right now. <laughs> yeah, that's probably part of it. Probably was at least partially a balancing decision. I, that wouldn't surprise me. Um, but yeah, it, it they do still they feel like they bump up against each other a bit. That's for sure. Um, but yeah, no, nothing, nothing too remarkable there. I don't think. Um, no, I mean, I, I think it's interesting that they, you, you already brought it up, mm-hmm. but the, the fact that, uh, agility is like this, it's a middle ground between dexterous movement and athletic ability. It's like a good, like, I like that that's its own thing or just bouncing off of you. Yeah, like I get, I get it, but I think people are probably going to get the two confused a bit. I would imagine. Probably, yes. But, you know, whatever. Uh, you wrote it down in your notes, but the, the, the lack of a um, concrete constitution stat, I think, is fascinating. Well, yeah, I mean, there's no con stat because what would be dictated by your constitution is just dictated by your class instead. You know, your damage thresholds and your HP and stuff that all just is dictated by your class instead. So they, yeah, you don't really need a con score, which I'm fine with because constitution always kind of feels like a waste in D&D anyway. You know, like it, it doesn't feel like it contributes so. to much. Like the only things are con saves or con they saves don't even really ask for con checks in the game as nope. often. I can't think of any, actually. No, yeah, I mean, I can't think of any con checks, but the it's direct tie into your HP, I think is what. That's the yeah. only that's the only thing, though. So it's one of those things that you'll you'll take for a tie into HP and then you'll forget about it. You know what I mean? Like and if they had some constitution skills, like, I don't know, something like called or party, class yeah, based like, on constitution or. Yeah, well, so that yes. Um, but the thing that I've always said is that unarmed defense should always take your constitution into account. Because you're, it's not that you're not getting hit; it's that you're tanking hits and just not being that hurt by it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're absorbing the damage. At least, at least as far as barbarian goes. Yeah. Well, it is part of barbarian. I can see that. No, it is, but like monk also has it. So monk, I, I, it makes sense monk that doesn't it's wisdom have it. in dex. Monk has an armor defense. Oh, yeah, yeah has on, but it doesn't have con. No, it doesn't. No, have that's, con. What that, saying, that's what I'm saying. What I'm yeah. saying is that both of them have it, but if barbarians got to use their con and you know whatever another stat that would be fine Mm. like it actually i think it is con for barbarian it is it's con plus dex it's con dex and then oh so you know my bad what i was thinking of is it should be strength and con not dex and con strength and con yeah that's different 
Yes. Mm. Well, because if like if you think about it purely mechanically, a barbarian is not a dex based character. So the fact that you have to like put uh, you, have, you need an out tertiary stat where they, where they really all they should need is their strength and con. But now that you have to assign something for dex, it would be better and simpler it's, to just make all of their stuff based on con and strength. You can effectively play a more it's better to play a dex focused barbarian than a strength barbarian, which Isaiah does not. Like. Yes. Uh, which I mean, yes, yes, I also don't like it. It is annoying. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's fine removing the con stat. I don't think I don't think you really lost anything. And the stuff that the con stat would have done is just taken up as advancements on your character sheet anyway. Like you can bump your HP and you can bump your damage thresholds uh, when you level as a as a level up choice. And that's probably what con would have dictated anyway. So it's fine. It does the jib. Mm. Uh, they also so also you have a preset array. Um, this is another thing that Apocalypse World does where you have a preset array that you can basically uh, pick from to decide mm -hmm. where your stats go in. I haven't seen anything in the game that talks about an upper or lower limit for your character traits. Kind of like how D D has standard array, but then there's point by like it doesn't seem to be. There's a no other options. It's only here. standard array. Yeah, it's only Which, it's an array of numbers that you can move around as you. Actually, I said it's like Apocalypse World. I'm kind. That's kind of half true because you can move the numbers around in Dagger Heart. Technically, in Apocalypse yeah, World, so I, said, I, I thought you couldn't do that. Yeah. In Apocalypse World, you have uh, four different arrays that you choose from. Mm. So you have four preset ones and you choose which one you're going to use. Uh, in this, you have a standard array and you can move the numbers around individually. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, it's not exactly the same. I, I, I misspoke there a little bit, uh, but it's a for, similar vibe. Yeah, for having a standard array in the game, though, does make it more easy, easier of use for like new players coming in. It does. Like, I don't have to think. Oh, I could just put my stat, put these numbers here. There you go. I don't have to like worry about. Oh, do I have twenty-seven points? I could do this, or I have to roll, and I roll like really shit on dice. Honestly, though, the thing that standard array does more is I don't. It's less about the new care, new player uh, experience. Standard array helps a lot for balancing your game and designing around it because you know the starting number layout for characters. It mm -hmm. it can't change, so it's easier to design a good beginning of your game because yeah. what you do right is if you add them all so like in apocalypse world if you add all the starting arrays together they all come to the same number which is plus one like no matter how they're split up they all add up to plus one mm. uh if you do it with dagger heart if you add them up it's a plus three total uh so you have that base number you know that everyone's going to have a plus three total that's going to be divvied around. It helps for the, with the design stand standpoint of things. Mm -hmm. I do. Th also, I think it's funny that the stats are all either plus two, plus one, zero or minus one, because that's again, Apocalypse World. You only ever the highest stat you ever have is a plus two. Uh, and it can't go beyond that unless you get a special ability. Daggerheart, you can go beyond that. And like I said, I didn't see um, any mention of upper bounds or lower bounds. I was so going to ask, know. what is like the maximum? I guess you can increase the stat, and what is the the lowest you can have a stat? There's no so uh, obviously like no you're, indication, right? You're not going to lower your stat, so obviously the lowest you're going to have is a minus one. Um, mm. There's no upper limit, but the thing is, the way leveling up works, you're only ever going to be able to get so high because you have to choose. So when you level up, you can mark to increase your traits, but that is limited by the amount of times you can do that uh, based on the tiers. So yeah, uh, you can. In so when you level up in the first tier, it'll it says it literally says at the top. If you look at the character sheets mm. and you scroll down to the little level section, increase yeah. two unmarked character traits by plus one and then mark them. So mm. what that means is. For example, if I level up from one to two and I would like to increase my agility and my strength, I increase those. I have now marked those 
when I level up to three, I can't pick the same ones again because yeah. they're marked. But once you bump to the next tier of play, so mm. two to four is tier one, five to seven is tier two. Once you bump over into level five, you clear the marks and now you can reset so you could bump agility and strength again, potentially. So there isn't, yeah. they don't state an upper or lower bound, but there's essentially an upper or low, there's an upper bound baked into how the leveling up works. You're only ever going to be able to get something. Essentially, you're only ever going to be able to level to bump a stat three times. Any one stat three times. Yeah. So what the highest you get. So plus five plus five is the max. Oh, uh, yeah. That'd be your max. Yeah. And you met. You can also hypothetically, you can play a character from one to ten. Ten being the max in this game, by the way. Oh, yes. Yeah. And not increase your stats at all. You can. Yes. Which is just <laughs> it's a little nuts. <laughs> little nuts, but like it's possible, and that that that, that doesn't come across. Crazy that that option is available in general. That actually doesn't across come across as very weird to me because I've, I've seen other games do a similar thing. Mm. That's true of blades too, or it can be. It's unlikely. Let's put it this way: it could be true of blades. It is unlikely, but it could be. It's yeah. I was gonna say it's very unlikely. It's unlikely <laughs> given how it works. Um, yeah. Please hold. Sorry. <clears throat> Has some phlegm. Uh, mm. All right. Yeah, nice and gross. Okay. Proficiency. Proficiency is kind of weird in this game. I, I didn't even I didn't even realize they had proficiency. Yeah, because. As far as I can do, the only thing it affects, as far as I can tell, the only thing it affects is damage. That's all. I, as I, I haven't seen anywhere else where proficiency has come up. Um, the way it works is your proficiency is the the amount of damage dice you roll for an attack is equal to your proficiency. Oh, so I see it. if your proficiency is two and your weapon rolls a D6, you roll two D6. Oh, what the uh, fuck? and your proficiency will go up as you level. Um, so damage numbers are going to potentially get kind of fat because uh, by the end you're going to be rolling like six or seven d6 something like that for like an attack or you know whatever whatever your damage oh, is. So okay. they will be getting kind of fat asterisk um, because of the way that HP works. Well we'll get there we'll get there. Actually we're literally about to get there next because that's the next thing that's about to come up. Oh <laughs> yeah so I read the note. <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> Uh, the well, here's the thing, Isaiah. The damage numbers will be getting kind of fat. The HP damage won't be right because yes, yes, and I, ooh, baby. Okay, yeah. This so <laughs> this is one of the things in the game that I just really not a fan. This is one of the I would say uh, clunkiest clunky bits in the game. I'm not gonna say it's the clunkiest, but it's clunky. This has been one of the biggest complaints so far that I've watched or heard. Or biggest read complaint about. I've heard has been the initiative system, but that's I, the I, that is that's the uh, other number one. one. This is this yeah. is the second. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, for audience sake, I'm going to step by step how this works, and then we're going to talk about it uh, because it's it's kind of a lot. Um, actually, before I do that, I would just like to say from you two. Uh, let's do a Wizards of the Coast scale. Uh, very satisfied, satisfied, neutral, dissatisfied, or very dissatisfied. Where do you fall on the HP mechanics? I don't. Here's the other thing. I, I can't even call it HP mechanics because it's like four mechanics rolled into one. But let's just say it's the HP mechanic for the sake of I'm, explaining. <laughs> Where do you fall? I'm not going to lie. I'm, I'm going to go with very dissatisfied. Very dissatisfied. Uh, Ooh, okay. I'm going to go with dissatisfied. Dissatisfied. Okay. I am also. It adds in, an extra step into combat and math and adding it's health. It's more than one, like, Matt. I, <laughs> You're saying yeah. an extra like three steps. Extra three. Yeah. Okay. yeah so, well, that's what I mean. Like it, it adds an extra layer of complexity that didn't need to be there. Cool idea. Hold on. Hold on. Don't get too deep yeah. into it because I want to explain it before we get deep into it. Mm -hmm. But we'll, we'll, Don't worry, Matt. We'll come to it. It, yeah, so, uh, yeah, I'm also going to say dissatisfied. 
Um, not no, very. I'll change mine to dissatisfied. Then, I, like, I'm not. I don't hate it. Yeah, I don't hate I do, it. Like, I, get... I like that they account for damage There's you some... take. Ver like, uh, like the fact that like you have to roll the hit, and then you deal your damage, and then the person takes a number of damage. There's base like that. That is an, uh, a sort of translation to the damage you've done. I like the idea of it and i just do not like the execution so i'm gonna yeah i'll say yes. dissatisfied not very dissatisfied. there's some uh, there's some bits of it that are kind of fun conceptually and fictionally so okay all right so how how, how, how does damage how does damage and hp work in this game all right so every uh so everybody starts the game with six hp by the way, if you'd like to take another shot, um, six HP is also the amount of HP you start with in Apocalypse World. <laughs> and everybody has six HP in that game, too. Uh, so everybody has six points of HP. You can increase your HP later down the road through leveling, but you start at six. And then every class has damage thresholds. So the way the flow of an attack works is uh, a monster attacks you as a player. Let's say you are a uh, actually you no know, hold on I'm gonna I'm gonna pull up my rogue character stab it the ribbit real quick so I can have some concrete numbers to explain this. Of course I should have done this before. Do we? I was gonna say before that. Do we want to go over at least like what the classes are in the game or is they're D and D like, classes? Okay, I like. They're the D and D classes you're used to. There's not. I mean, is there even one that's weird? I don't think well, so. Well, no. I meant just like uh, to guardians, guardians, paladin. Uh, it's a, it it's a little smite. tank. It's, it's a little different, but paladin. it's mostly uh, archety It's archetypally going for paladin, more or less. I I don't really feel like there's anything to say about the classes. Well, it's just for people who didn't haven't like. I mean, looked at this to like, list them off. Be. It's Bard, Druid, Guardian, Ranger, Rogue, Seraf, Sorcerer, Warrior, Wizard. Guardian is Paladin. Seraph is Cleric. Warrior is Fighter. The rest of them have the same names. That's it. Mm. There's nothing crazy there. I, I do wish they had changed some of the names. Okay. Uh, anyway. D okay, so HP and damage. So, a monster attacks your character let's go with I'm gonna go with uh, using a rogue as an example um, so you have an evasion score which side note I uh not crazy about uh, the word evasion because <laughs> evasion implies a very particular thing which is you're getting out of the way but then the book also explicitly says that evasion doesn't only mean you're dodging out of the way of an attack it could mean you're blocking it it could mean you're using magic to deflect it it could mean you're parrying something and i immediately so go armor class or just call it defense sport, like yeah, yeah. just defense. call it defense anyway yeah. it doesn't matter so you have an evasion score it's effectively your ac so my character stab at the ribbit he's a uh he's a rogue with 13 evasion so the monster attacks me the bear, the, the mutated zombie bear takes a swipe at me. The zombie bear rolls a 15. That goes over my evasion, so he hits. Okay. Zombie bear now rolls damage. Let's say he rolls 15 damage. Every character has damage thresholds. So for a rogue at level 1, the thresholds are 4 is your minor, 9 is your major, 14 is your severe. Uh... Minor damage is one point of HP damage. Major damage is two points of HP lost. Severe damage is three points of HP lost. So the bear attacks me. He deals 15 damage to me. That would be severe damage. So I would mark three points of HP loss. However, I have armor. So the GM hits me. He says you are being dealt 15 damage. I say I would like to mark one point of armor that one point of armor drops it from 15 down to 12 incoming damage 12 incoming damage is below severe but above my major so i take two points of hp damage 
However, oh no, I've gone cross-eyed. However, I can mark armor multiple times if I want. So if I wanted, I could say, I would like to mark my armor twice for six points of armor reduction instead of just three. Sorry, I have armor three in this scenario. Uh, I would like to mark my armor twice for six points of armor reduction. So the 15 damage goes down to nine damage. And then I look and go, oh, my, my threshold for major is nine. I want to mark armor a third time, bringing it down to what? Uh, six damage. Now I'm taking one point of HP damage. So the steps are monster attack. Check against evasion. Evasion has been passed or failed. Cool. Monster does X amount of damage. Compare it to your damage thresholds. Would you like to mark armor? Yes or no. How many slots of armor? Zero to three. And you can get more. Po you can get more slots of armor later, but at level one, zero to three. Now compare after marking armor damage threshold. How much HP damage are you taking? That's for every attack. You have to go through all of those steps for every attack. That's where it becomes a problem. <laughs> because that's essentially four or five steps for every attack. Just to know how much damage I fucking just took. to know how much HP damage you took. Yes. And this is something that the DM doesn't really have to worry about from what I looked at. No, Actually, no. From monsters, monsters have monsters have damage thresholds. Oh, they do. Yep. Uh, yep. I didn't see that. I was looking at the monster moves. They I have was like, nope. Yeah, they have damage thresholds like everybody oh, else. Oh, God. So even the DM has to do this. What yes, the, shit? the DM has to do this for every monster, too. Ugh. And also, if your if the damage in there's one other sorry there's one other scenario if the incoming damage is below your minor threshold you take a point of stress instead because there's a stress mechanic in this game which is effectively just stamina you mark stress for a whole bunch of different things to like use abilities or overcome a problem or stuff or the gm might tell you tell you to mark stress if you like failed a roll or something like that uh, so if it's below your minor you take the stress Here, here's the thing with this and the reason that and I don't know if this is the same reason for you guys or not, but this is the reason that this bugs me. There is a and buckle up, gentlemen, I'm about to go on a rant. Get comfy. There's a there's a sliding scale that you move back and forth in game design. All right. If a mechanic is more not a sliding scale, there's an inverse scale is what I should say. There's an inverse scale. So if a mechanic is more complicated and requires more steps, then you should be doing it less often. And if a mechanic is simpler and requires less steps, you can do it more often. And those two things should have an inverse relationship. How complicated is the mechanic? How often does the mechanic come up? Those should always have an inverse relationship. So to give you the D&D, &D, to use D&D &D as the, you know, the touchstone example, an attack roll in D&D &D is very simple. Roll die, add bonuses, check against a number. So you do that a lot in D&D, &D, but it's not that hard to do, so it doesn't it's not exhausting, you know? You don't have to check five different numbers every time you attack someone. You check what you rolled and then you check the enemy's number. Nice and simple. For every subsequent step to an attack, it gets slightly more complicated, but happens slightly less often. So you attack a monster. That's that happens often. Actually hitting a monster and dealing damage in D&D happens less often, right? Because you're going to miss sometimes. So when you hit a monster, there's a second step. You roll your damage dice and add them together. But that happens less often than a regular attack. Having advantage or disadvantage. That happens less often than both of those things, but it adds another step. But it's okay because it doesn't happen as often. So if you have advantage or disadvantage, you check, you roll two dice, compare which is higher or lower, take the one that you need to take, add your bonus, attack. Uh, rolling an attack, hitting with advantage or disadvantage, 
and getting a crit, that happens even less often. So the math of, oh, I rolled, I got a crit. I now need to roll another pool of dice and add that to my initial pool of dice is another step, but it's okay because it's the rarest, it's the rarest event in the attack. That's how okay. that should work. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Am I making sense? Yeah. Yep. Okay. The damage threshold checking uh, to figure out how much HP you have uh, that you have to, you know, take happens for every single attack in the game. No, okay, not true. If you miss, you don't have to do this. But if you get hit, you have to compare against your damage threshold and consider if you want to mark armor or not and then mark HP once it's all said and done every time you get hit. That's like a four step process for something that's happening pretty often. <laughs> yeah. So yes. uh, in a D&D &D comparison, all the math that you would have, all, everything you have to do if you attack with advantage and get a crit. Imagine if you had to do all those steps for every single attack. That's kind of hmm. what we're looking at. Not exactly, but kind of. I wonder, I mean, because they're probably going to have like a virtual tabletop for this or they're going to sure, want to yeah. try and push Almost this. Certainly. I mean, I'm sure it'll be on like Roll20 and stuff for sure. Yeah. 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 Because like I could see the Roll20 like it just does it for you. So you oh, don't yeah, have to yeah, think yeah. about it. And you're like, OK, Roll20 so, like, will automate using... this stuff, I'm sure. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. or any. Yes. But, but if they're going to try and sell this into because like um, I know I sent you guys the video uh, of the, the press packet. They gave a couple people that actually had all the cutout cards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And everything. Oh, it's kind of I mean, it'll that, have the, a physical book, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. But what I'm saying is the re for the press package, it seems like when the game comes out, they're going to do the Wizard of the Coast thing where it's in a box so they can sell it to certain companies like Walmart uh -huh. and Target. Yeah, yeah. Because that's why the you know lost mine of fendelver that's why the uh the other the the D, D essentials book or you know game yes they were boxes they were uh, starter sets and shit because walmart doesn't they don't sell game books like that they don't sell those products oh, it they has sell to be a box set it had to be a box set which was literally like when they were releasing the essentials kit chris perkins was like the only reason we made this a box is because our our deal with target they don't sell books, so we had to make it a box. And we're like, all right, well, we'll just do another starter set. I didn't know that. So I can okay. see Darrington Press with that same mindset from what I've seen from yeah. the boxes of being like, well, we can sell this, you know, As Barnes & Noble set. can hold it, yeah. but we can also hit a bigger market and sell it to Target or Walmart, and they actually mm -hmm. sell those kinds of products. Yeah, I would say that's probably a likely scenario, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, my my point going back to uh, auto yeah, roll twenty will automate automate this and make it a lot easier. People who are playing uh, the box sets when it eventually comes out to Target, uh, not so much. Suck a duck. I don't know what it's gonna do. <laughs> yeah, quick math. Yeah, yeah. So that's basically that's pretty much where my uh, my issue with it comes from is that it's it's too many steps for how often this event is occurring. And it's, I think it's just going to get tiring, you know? No. Especially combat. Like, that's the, like, these are... Yes. You know, yes. these are, yes, I get it. You're more of a narrative well, fantasy heroic story game, but, I like, it's also about killing monsters, fighting monsters and shit. Like, it is. I, in, in their defense, I think combat is probably going to uh, be less often and I think combat overall is going to be quicker like I don't think you're going to have fights that last as long as D&D &D, so that that will help a bit like I don't think you're going to be making as many rolls and the reason I say that is because in a game like Blades or Apocalypse World or Dungeon World you generally don't end up making as many attack rolls even there isn't even actually an attack roll technically in the game uh, you don't end up making as many combat rolls in this fashion because generally like things like HP numbers will be smaller, you know, moves are moves are intended to cover more ground than a single attack in D and D does. Basically a single roll has a bigger impact. So you make them less. Uh, so there is that, but you're still going to be making them pretty often. Uh, I mean, if you watch the one shot that critical role did, you're still making attacks pretty often, like at the end of the day. So it's, yeah, so, it's, yeah. it's a lot. 
Yeah, I mean, you. so you probably... We talked about this yesterday a little bit. What you'll probably see as far as combat goes in Daggerheart is like small scale, almost squad based uh, skirmishes or you fighting one or two big things because the game really can't support even like medium sized combat. Well, it supports like, medium sized combat via different types of monsters. There's like horde monsters and um, minion monsters and stuff for that specifically. Yes, yes. But like. Like when I say medium sized combat, you you won't be able to have more than say ten things on the field. And granted, yes, you don't necessarily need them because they have things like hordes and swarms and whatnot, and 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 like minions, just. But like, uh, the game is just not. And it's pretty clear in its design. It's just not built around that, right? Like, um, your armor gives you a slot that you can use that you can only re- like you can only replenish your your ability to use said armor when you take a rest, which might not like. Fair enough, can be often, Short or but long, it's yeah. not enough to support, say, like, a dungeon delve. Um, um, no. You I, just I, don't I, have the the pure, like, resource numbers to support things like that. No, I mean, I, yeah, I don't think that they're going for any kind of dungeon delve thing, that's for sure. I mean, you can do some dungeon delving, but it, it's not going to feel... It's going to be a different style of dungeon delving to the way mm-hmm. 5e intends for you to do it, that's for sure. Um, yes, you, you also, you can't, like, so a, a really... A way that a lot of people do combat in 5e, uh, which is like wave based combat, where it's like, okay, you fight a wave, uh, you may or may not get a rest, and then you fight that just to keep the the field from being flooded at all times, you know? Uh, I mm-hmm. think you could do that um, in this game, have, all right. I think that, I think wave based will you work could. fine. I don't think it'll be a problem. Don't they kind of have it with uh, it, uh, it just, I just want to, oh, sorry. I was going to say, it doesn't seem like player characters and enemies have the health or ability to reduce damage enough to support that kind of combat. You can get maybe one or two waves in, uh, but again, it would have to be pretty symmetrical in the amount of numbers that you're able to throw at things. Like, you know, you, you I, need round about the same amount of, of things on the field that you need as players. Again, I haven't played it, so I can't say I don't, I don't think so. Gaging, gauging by looking at the monsters and by what I saw in, in, the, in the one shot, I think you could do a, a wave-based thing fine it, it's not to gonna be say, it, it won't be uh, like correct. massive waves of 25 or anything but i think you could still do it yeah josh correct me if i'm wrong but don't they have a wave combat in the the, the starter adventure they give you i don't know i didn't read the starter adventure but mercer kind of did a little bit of a wave thing in the one shot not not all in the exact same combat but he did a couple of combats with them not having a break in between basically and yeah. there are boss monsters in the adversary section that specifically have phases that are essentially like boss waves so i i don't think that'll be a problem um the the idea of like and a a huge amount of things on the you know all attacking you at once on the the board quote unquote at once yeah that'll definitely be less so it's it's gonna be uh less enemies and bigger enemies generally uh unless you're specifically using the horde or minion type monsters which are there to give you like the idea is if you want to have that feel of your players cutting through the zombie horde you're going to use the horde type monsters like that's what they're there for um, do they, um, I may not have gotten it like far enough in the books. I know this for a fact, but do they talk about, uh, like average numbers to put in weight and like a uh, horde or minion type monsters? Do they, do they do any of that work to sort of be like, to not get you overrun like you do in fantasy flight, right? If like a horde is too big, you get clapped in the uh, first round and then you can slowly whittle it down. But at that point, a lot of your resources are spent just trying not to die immediately. I don't. I don't remember if they specifically say, but if I remember correctly, it doesn't really matter because the hordes don't get stronger with more units in them the way they do in Fantasy Flight. Okay, It's like they get weaker as you beat on them, but they don't necessarily get stronger if they get bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, instead, probably you would just kind of chop them up into like smaller squad groups or something like that. I forget exactly. They do give some some general guidance on it a little bit, but I forget exactly what it says. Um, hmm. The other thing, though, uh, what, was, what was it? Crap, now I forgot. Hordes, HP values. 
Dang. Completely lost it. That's annoying. <laughs> um, yeah, so the... The whole HP system... I'm not going to say it needs to be thrown out completely, uh, but I think it definitely needs to be looked at pretty heavily. And I think, honestly... Because this game... I think they're really trying to target a their int- their intention for this game is to be your second RPG, right? Like I think this game assumes, hey, you've played D and D. Would you like to play something a little different? Uh, that's the ar- that's the audience I think they're really aiming at with this game. Um, because just by the way they phrase things and the advice they give and stuff. And I feel like if this is somebody's second RPG after they've played D&D, the HP damage threshold armor armor system, I think is going to be pretty confusing for a lot of new players. Yeah, I can see a lot of people getting confused on this one and just confused about shit. I mean, what <laughs> step checks first and stuff, you know, the order of operations and shit. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it, it's it's safe to say that it's it at least for a moment stumped each of us. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I definitely had to sort of read through it carefully and then hear it get explained in the video also. And then I was like, OK, I get it. And I I mostly un- was able to understand it because I have some comparison points from other games doing somewhat of a similar thing. Um, although the damage threshold system, I don't know if I've personally seen anywhere else off the top of my head so but like armor value stuff and lower hp numbers and stuff like that that i got or that i know i've seen i should say yeah no i damage threshold no i can't say i've seen that anywhere else Um, yeah i i couldn't think of it uh yeah so that's that's one of the big clunky things uh for me personally um but in terms of player side stuff that's probably the my biggest bugbear on the player side of the game i think a lot of my other bugbears on the game are gm side i don't think uh like i think most of the player side of this game is is pretty solid in terms of you know mechanical design uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I had to say on that about the, on HP the health system. and armor. No, no, just the, the general like player side stuff. It's funny. I had like a, I said a bunch of shit yesterday, and I can't fucking remember what it was. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I mean, just kind of going down, like where for the for the next point. Um, I'm assuming with the experiences, Josh, you like it. I'm. I love it. I'm still confused on what the fuck it even means. Okay. I actually also like it quite a bit. Uh, so okay. I, I but think that's yeah. also because it's real quick. Uh, yeah. So in the in the way that you read Josh, like some stuff, and you're like, oh, that's Blades thing. I read experiences. I was like, that's oh, these are just Lancer triggers. Yes. Nice. Yes. <laughs> well, if you look in my notes, Isaiah, I also called out Lancer triggers. No, no, I saw that. Yeah, that, yeah. Well, that's, that's why I was I I was reading them this morning while I was like getting ready for work, and I was laughing because I was yeah. like, I also said that. <laughs> Yes, I compared them to Lancer yeah. Triggers and Professions in Shadow of the Demon Lord. So, okay, Matt, I will I will try and clear your confusion on it because I think you're probably over. Th- you're probably making it more complicated in your head than it is. Um, probably because I'm getting the the uh, thing like mass where I'm like it's vague and I'm like I don't get it. It's not as it 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 it's not it's, actually it's not actually vague. that vague. It basically so you pick well, your experiences, right? Or, and and you you. I think we should explain the core dice. It just occurred to me. We should explain the core dice rolling mechanic first. Yes. Yes. Because yes, yes, yes. we forgot. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know how this we whole thing ass back. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how we skipped over the core dice rolling. I, I don't know why I missed this. So we're not talking about the classes. We're not talking about the races. We're not going to talk about the dice you need. Yeah. OK. So the way the core dice rolling mechanic of the game works is you roll 2d12 and then you add your character trait you know, and any other potential modifiers. So for example, let's say you're rolling with your strength, you would roll 2d12. Let's say you get, you know, uh, you know, a five and a six, that would be 11. And then your strength is plus two. You add two, your total is 13. That's the core 
That's the core. It's always 2d12 plus your bonuses. That's your core resolution thing. Then you have effectively degrees of success, which come from this idea of hope and fear. Now, I, I, I think we're all on the same page that none of us like the words hope and fear. <laughs> we're all on that Correct. same page. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't dislike it, but I don't like it either. Yeah. OK. Yeah. I, I want it to be something more evocative. Hope and fear just sound. They're not that exciting. And my other thing is like the word hope. Like I hear the word hope and I don't think the opposite of hope is fear. That's not what I think of. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I, I feel like the opposite of hope is like despair or sadness. Despair. Yeah. Yeah. It's so despair. fear felt like a weird choice to me. Um, but also I want, I feel like they should be called like heroism and like malevolence or something like that. I want them to feel oh, a little I, more I, over the top. I, I came up with one this morning that I thought was pretty good. Will and woe. That's yeah, that's pretty good. I think the only, re- the only <laughs> thing with that is that um, I feel like they want them to sound heroic. So maybe it would be like willpower and uh, what would be a, something a little more dramatic version of woe. I think that's the idea is they're supposed to be kind of heroic evoking a concept like heroically. You know what I mean? I don't know. Anyway, uh, I don't hate Will and Willow. Um, So you, yes. So you have this hope and you have a hope die and a fear die. So if you're playing in person, you'll say my green dice are my hope dice and my blue dice are my fear dice. So every time you roll, you look at the two dice compared to each other. If your hope rolls higher than your fear, then the check you made is a check with hope. And if your fear is higher, it's with fear. So in the example I gave before, you rolled a 13. If the hope is higher, you would say I rolled a 13 with hope. And if it's fear, you would say I rolled a 13 with fear. When you roll with hope on your player care on your character sheet, you add a point of hope which is basically a currency for you as a player to spend on like abilities and powers and tag team attacks, stuff like that. And then if you roll a fear, the GM gets a fear point and the GM can spend fear points to like augment monsters or make extra bad things happen, et cetera, et cetera. Essentially what this is, is a degree of success system kind of similar to how fantasy flight star Wars does it. So if you fail a check, but you failed with hope. So you rolled under the DC, but your hope die was higher than your fear die. What you get is, okay, you don't accomplish what you wanted, but you get something as like a consolation in return. So the GM might be like, you're trying to sneak past the guards. You fail with hope. Okay. You get caught by the guards. They see you, but you rolled with hope. So they're caught off guard. They're they're sort of caught confused for a moment and they don't immediately start chasing after you. You have a moment for a breather. What do you do? So you failed your action, but you get something else along with it. Conversely, if you succeed with fear, it's the opposite. Uh, You're trying to sneak past the guards. You succeed with fear. You do so. You have snuck past the guards. You slip into another nearby room. You have now found yourself trapped in said nearby room because the guards are now patrolling the hall just outside of the room. You're safe for the moment, uh, but now you have to find a new way out of this scenario. That's that's the basic gist. And then if you roll, if you succeed with hope, extra good. If you fail with fear, extra bad. And then if the two dice you roll are identical, whether you fail or not, you get a critical success. So I thought this that I thought that part was kind of interesting. So if you roll like let's say the DC is 15 and you roll a 2 and a 2, so your total's 4, it doesn't matter. You get a critical you get a critical success and automatically beat the DC no matter what. Even though you rolled two twos. Uh which I thought was kind of interesting. So it doesn't matter if it's lower or higher or anything. It's just if they match up, you're you're good to go. I think that's kind of fun because then it's like even if you get double ones, you're like, oh, shit, double ones. <laughs> you know, I don't know. I thought that was kind of a fun idea. Uh, yeah, no, I, I like that. It's a pretty 
um, easy and eloquent way to, to to quantify a critical success. Just you roll the same dice twice. Yeah. Good. It's very straightforward. Um, yeah. It all. It, 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 I, I knew it wasn't going to do this, but the I, you know, it just reminds me uh, that I think it's Pathfinder where you have to crit and then confirm crit for it to actually be oh, a crit. The, and oh, you're like, I hate why? Them. Why is this a thing? I hate this. This is stupid. I hate confirm uh, crits. Yep. <laughs> um. So that's your that's your core die mechanic. So when you roll. Uh, I mentioned you add your character trait. You can also add your experiences. Now, let, let me just side note before I get into experiences. I hate the name experiences because it's confusing because you want to go, oh, it's experience points. No, it's not experience points. It's experiences with an S. And it's what they're saying is it's your life experiences, as in things you experience you know, in your past, in in your life. That's what they mean by experiences. I feel like they should just call it background traits or background something because the word experiences immediately confused me. Even though it's not a confusing mechanic. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I don't hate it as experiences. I, I As much as I like if, the triggers in Lancer, I don't particularly like that they're called triggers. Triggers is a little bit of a um, weird one, yeah. Maybe just so call, maybe just maybe I'm like maybe call them life experiences. Maybe that nah, would be better. It's not snappy. It's not snappy, but experiences is going to make everyone think XP. Even though the, the correct, game, I the mean, ga- like the game I doesn't just, have like, XP, but yeah, I, I don't know. I for me, I almost want to just call them skills. They're not. They're a little but, bit more than skills, though, because they're also a bit about your character's background. You know. Yeah. Like they uh, are skills, but they also inform some of your character's background. Like they tell you about your character. I would say talents, but uh, Lancer specifically hasn't a thing called talents, so you can't do that one. Uh, talent. Yeah, I don't know um, if talents works. I don't know. It, they could workshop it, maybe. I don't know. Uh, yeah, the name. Uh, yeah, but I think we could sit but happily and say the name needs workshop. It needs a little workshop. So the way it works is, you start the game with one experience at plus two and one at plus one, and the experience is just—it's a phrase or a word that you put down on your sheet that comes from your character's background. And when I say background, I mean their history as a character before they were an adventurer in some fashion, you know. Um, and when you trigger or, or not even trigger when your experience would be relevant, you can spend hope to add the experience bonus to your role. So to give you an example, your character used to be a town guard. So maybe one of their experience, their plus two experience is guarding or guardship. And you're in a fight and one of your allies is like, defend me while I try and like do some magical ritual behind you. And then the warrior player says, I got you chief. And then a monster, you know, an orc charges the warrior and the warrior says, I'm going to throw up my shield and I'm just going to, as soon as he gets near me, my plan is to just push him back as far as I can. I don't even care if I hurt him or not. And the GM says, cool, roll me with your, you know, uh, roll plus your strength. And then the player says, I would like to use my experience of guardship to add my pl- to add another plus two, and so the GM says, "Okay, cool, yeah, that makes sense. You are a guard. You're good at protecting things. Spend a hope, add plus two to the roll. So the the character would roll. They would add their strength bonus. Let's let's say it's a plus two, and then they would also add another plus two for their guardship experience. And what you do is when you do when you make your character at character creation, you call those experiences whatever you want. You just name them." anything you want as long as they make sense to who your character is so like i if i remember correctly uh one of the suggested ones uh on the like in the section where it talks about it is uh it's like the royal chef and it's just like oh my character used to be a royal chef so when i talk to people who are like nobles for example 
I could potentially get a bonus to my roles to talk to the nobility because I've been around these kind of people before. I've experienced them. I, I know what it's like to deal with them. Another one could be, yeah, you know, I like it could also be kind of just a sentence like I'm good at stealing. And then it's like if stealing comes up, you could add the, <laughs> steal, you know, add, add stealing. Yeah, it's like you basically you want to pick like examples for good examples for backgrounds. The way that they, they sort of describe it is occupations, hobbies, talents, skills, or, or phrases, a piece of your history. Yeah, or a phrase of your history. Um, to give you an example, uh, it says backgrounds, uh, specializations, skills, and then it says phrases like chef to the royal family. I won't let you down. Street doctor. This is not a negotiation. I'll catch you. Mm-hmm. So, like, this is not a negotiation. If you're negotiating with a character, you could spend hope to get that bonus for this is not a negotiation because you know, you know, you're good at, or if you're intimidating a character, I guess is where that would come up because you're good mm-hmm. at intimidating. Um, and then the backgrounds, it says like bodyguard, con artist, noble, merchant, specializations, it says his magical historian, navigator, sharpshooter, skills, it says bartering, repairing, tracking, quick hands. So you could just make them, you know, D and D esque skills if you wanted, which probably a lot of newer players will do initially. I would bet. Mm. Yeah, I can see that being a thing. Okay. You, you get the the vibe of them, Matt. Yeah, I get them a little better. I'm also rereading it. I'm still not super keen on it, but I I understand it a little better now. It's essentially the the way you could think about it is it's essentially you're making your own skills for your character. Like rather than having a preset skill list, you're deciding on skills for your character that you care about. And it it lets you specialize and and sort of focus your character in a little bit more to like represent them more as a person and they're yeah. fun because they're also fun yeah. because you can use them in creative ways you know like this is not a negotiation as a phrase there's a lot of ways you could argue with the GM how you could potentially use that you know mm. they're also as multifaceted as you want or need them to be yeah so if you use for example like assassin is one of the ones that they recommend Anything that you can think of that would help you be an assassin is where that like that experience will help you. Yeah. So finding dirt on your target, disguising yourself, uh, figuring like uh, figuring out what poisons to use, coming up with a plan, uh, figuring out how to dispose of evidence. Any of that would fall under the assassin experience. Mm. Or if it's like uh, if you choose like um, shit architect. You're like, oh, well, I want to figure out how we can map this dungeon or I want to figure out how this trap works or I want to figure out how we can shoot an arrow into the gears to stop the portcullis from dropping. That's where you would ping architect. Okay. Yeah. I, I my the, the reason I like them in particular and and like I pointed out, I've seen them in other games. Shadow of the Demon Lord has a similar thing. Lancer has a similar thing. Um. I think they're particularly fun because you can use them in creative ways, you know, like the chef to the royal family. You're like, OK, well, that might be relevant to talking to nobles. That's interesting. But you could also be like someone goes, I think my food's been poisoned. And you go, can I use chef to the royal family to check the food? Because I know how to cook, you know, like you can throw them in in, in ways that get interesting and they create a little moment where everyone learns a little something about your character. Like, Oh yeah, that's kind of interesting. Like that makes sense. You know? And you Mm -hmm. could even make some more, you could even add to your backstory. Like, Oh yeah. Well, there was this one time when I was the chef to the King that they tried to poison the King. So I got really good at checking for poison, like in food. That was like a thing I learned how to do. And it's like, Oh, now we have a little bit more about your backstory. As opposed to just being like, my character is good at athletics. I roll an athletics check. You know what I mean? You can do it. You could you could get more creative with them. Granted, I guess the um, the like the negative side of that would be if somebody, you know, gets stressed out and is like, I can't think of anything. And then they just never use their ability, their experiences. 
I guess would be the negative side of that, but I don't feel like that would be that. I feel like that would be less of a problem. I don't see that coming up a lot. I think most people have that's part of the fun of doing a tabletop game is coming up with fictional, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. You also, you pick them yourself. So your ability to use them is, is completely up to and on you. Yeah. And, and you're invested in them. I ideally, or at least more invested in them. Uh, oh God. Yawn. Bad yawn. <laughs> Next thing I have down here domains yeah, uh, it's finally character stuff I, what we just talked about character stuff no but like making character stuff experience is part of making your character mm, yeah but that's like I think that's like towards the yeah that's literally step 12 Josh we skipped 12 other fucking steps I'm look I wrote down my notes in the order <laughs> that they were presented in the book I wrote as I read so I don't know what to tell you uh. Either way, uh, domains. I was I was actually quite confused <laughs> about domains on first reading. It took me a, a minute to like get what they are, uh, but th- they're just their ability pools. Yeah, their colors in Magic is 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 really what was, they are. I was about to say they're kind of like uh, Magic: The Gathering colors yeah. color wheel. Essentially. But, um, Hyper hyper focused. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, basically, uh, essentially your domains. Uh, every class has two domains, and the domain is a pool that you choose from with all the abilities. So, domain cards cover anything in Five E that would be a spell or a class ability or a feat, anything like that will just be covered by domains. Everything feeds into the domain pool with the exception of a couple of your uh, class abilities. Those are kind of their own thing, Um, but everything else feeds into the domain pool, Um, including, by the way, I don't know if you guys noticed, uh, including your ancestry, which also has its own card with the ability on it. So Mm -hmm. basically your character, once I realized what this is, I actually got really excited about this. You're building a TCD TCG deck for your character. You're yeah. building a deck and then that deck is your character's abilities. Uh, mm-hmm. And once I realized that's what it was. And as you level up, your deck gets bigger. I was like, oh, that's actually really fun because I love trading card games. Uh, the only reason I don't play Yu-Gi-Oh anymore is because it's expansive. And uh, uh, the rules for Yu-Gi-Oh are, are fucking garboder uh, right now. They, they've gotten crazier and crazier over the years, but yes. Um, but like I played Hearthstone for a while too. Love that. I played Card Fight Vanguard back in the day too. Um, Have you tried Slate Aspire? Uh, no, that's a deck builder though. That's not a trading card game. Oh, that's different. Um, but no, I haven't. I do like deck builders also, uh, but slightly different thing. Um, the so yeah, the the domain cards I think are super fun, and. There's a couple of cool things. You have a loadout, which is cool. Uh, so like once you get you can have, I think it's five domain cards. So as you get higher level, you're going to have more cards than you can have like slotted essentially. Uh, so on a rest, you can swap out what cards you have that you're currently using. And that's your loadout. And that's just fun to be like, hold on, guys, I got to rest and swap my loadout. Like it's like it's like swapping your note, you know, spells known in D and D, but every class gets to do it. So I'm I'm a big fan of that because I think that's uh-huh. just a fun time. Um, I think you can swap them out by taking stress too, or is that your yes, loadout? For yes, the- uh, you can also yeah, you can also like swap some stuff on the fly by taking stress. Oh, recall which is cool. cost. Yeah, yes, yeah. yeah, which is cool because you're like, oh man, I really wish I thought to grab this thing. Oh, I have enough stress to do it. All right, I'm gonna grab it. Like. Mm. That's fun. So it's it's more flexible than preparing a spell book, which is fun. Um, yeah. And even D and D is giving people that option now to like swap like one or two spells on a short rest. Uh, Fucking finally, yeah, finally, yeah. Um, also, some of the cards have like passive bonuses, uh, and some of the cards have ability like they can be removed from play. 
like a TCG, which I just is like, I just love it. I just like, I love the cards thing. I think that's fun. Um, there's like, they, I remember they call out a very specific spell. There's a resurrection spell uh, in the Splendor domain that uh, once it's played, it's removed from play permanently. And I just think that's a really fun idea because uh, it just feels like a card game. <laughs> Um, and the other thing that's fun is that the domains dictate your abilities so you can have two separate classes that can have some overlap between their domains so like every class has shares one domain with at least one other class so you can do like interesting inter-domain combo stuff you're like for example the sorcerer has midnight and the rogue has midnight. So they both pull from the midnight domain pool and they could do some like stealth magic combo thing where the sorcerer is like, all right, I have this spell to like help you go invisible. And then you take this other midnight ability to combo with it. And then we could do this like, you know, sick infiltration maneuver. Uh, so that's like the possibility there is really fun. And the domains also build into how multi-classing works. So when you multi-class, you get access to a third domain. So you can do even more of the like combo stuff. I think that there's just so there's so much fun potential here. I don't know. Maybe I'm getting too excited. I, I don't know. You guys are on the same page. No, no, I agree. I, I think the deck building is really cool. It gives hmm. you like. Let's put it this way. It's certainly more interesting than spell slots. Right, oh, like, yeah. Way more interesting than spell slots. It, it gives you there's like a, a a strategy to it that is, I think, personally more intuitive than staring at a character sheet because you have these things that like these for all intents and purposes, cards. what's on your character sheet matters far less than the cards in your hand or in your deck. Essentially, yeah. So if you're able to like like lay them out and go, OK, I can I can take this thing and you put it to the side and go, all right, I'm going to use that. And then I can take this thing and you put it to the side and go, OK, that's going to combo with that. But then that leave remove is removed from play, but that will give me another card for my deck. Okay, I can pick that up and then I put that down. Like, yeah, it 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 allows for players who might not be that tactically minded to think more tactically because it's rewarding them for playing with their little cards. It's like it's it's you it's it's like rewarding you for playing with your fidget toys. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, and plus yeah. think about it, you can also organize them in the way that makes sense to you, right? Because they're not just preset where they are on the character sheet. You can organize them in whatever order you want and like, oh, I use that ability. I turn it face down. Oh, this ability I want to use later. I'm going to turn it sideways next to this other card. So I remember to use them to get like you could mess around with it to help you remember what you do and don't have. There's all sorts of fun. Like there's all sorts of little fun things you can do with it. Mm -hmm. The yeah, one I know, thing I agree. I, I think the domains are really cool and I, I like I do want to give them a try. It's yeah. it's one of my favorite parts. At you. Uh, yes. Also. Yeah. yeah, I don't really have anything else to add. My, I the will say cool. the one thing I'm a little sad about is on a virtual tabletop, they're not going to be as fun to play with. Yes, I yeah, I have thought about that or I, I yeah. like it, it's not going to be a. I wouldn't go as far as to say that the VTT will be a worse experience, but it won't it will be certainly as tactile. be less. Yeah, it won't be as tactile, which kind of negates everything I just said. So, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah, it's it's unfortunate, but you know it'd be like that. I'm I'm hoping that maybe somebody comes up with something clever, it, you know, that they can integrate into a roll twenty or something like that uh, to make it still fun to use the domain cards on a VTT. But you know, time will tell. Mm. Um, and and actually, since because we're talking about it. Something that I've, I've a couple of people have pointed out, and uh, the Elder Lorecast they mentioned this, the the UI design for the character sheet is awesome in this game. Big fan yeah. of that. Did you? Yeah, it's pretty much impossible to get lost on it. Well, so uh, yes, but did you also did you see the? Um, I forget what they're calling it. So there's these there's these sheets of paper that come with the character cards that have the rules on them. And then if you slide the sheet to the left or right of your character sheet, it points at what those rules interact with what thing on your character sheet. 
Oh, I did not. I didn't know how you could. I didn't know you could do that. Yeah. So like, if you get the physical, some people have had the physical bundle. There's these. There's these sheets that have them all like they have like truncated rules listed out, and you can slide them left or right, and it will help. Like it'll be like this thing interacts with this. Oh yeah, yeah. I can't remember what they okay, call. That's them. pretty sexy. I'm not even gonna. Yeah, lie. <laughs> it's a super cool idea, and it and it and it it pairs with it pairs with the whole domain cards thing, right? This idea of like this, it's you, you, you have like a semi modular character sheet is what it comes down to, which is very cool. We can find. Um, I also think just the general layout of the character sheet is good, clean, solid, readable, just like as is. Yeah. Um, monster yeah, stat blocks, no are, complaints. monster stat blocks are equally clean, solid and readable, which is nice. Um, Oh, and the other thing, too, that I think is super sick about the domain cards is because they're individual cards, you can really easily add to them via supplements. You know, you're like, Mm -hmm. we added five new, you know, five new midnight domain cards. Here you go. And you just slot them in your game. Boom, bang, boom, like super easy. So the expandability is sick, (laughs) basically. Mm -hmm. It's actually so it's basically what I wanted from D&D, you know, cast your minds back, gentlemen, to 2018 when they did do like the big optional rules thing. Mm -hmm. And I was literally saying what I want them to do is with each expansion, each big one, right? Like drop some optional rules that you can swap in and out stuff. Yep. Yep. Um, on your character sheet. And they're kind of doing that with D&D's nuts a little bit. (laughs) Fucking one D&D's nuts. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, they're kind <laughs> of doing it where they're like, oh, well, you could kind of use whatever you want. It's like, well, yeah. that's kind of an issue in of itself because if you don't want to use it and your dungeon master says you have to use them, that like that specific set of rules, that's kind of annoying. But if you have like a, a tried and tested set of things that you can swap in and out, I feel like a GM would have less of a reason because it's all balanced to the same metric where 2014 and 2024 are two completely separate metrics that you'll have to keep track of now that's gonna be a pain in the dick like yeah pretty much yeah it it, it creates this it creates this great modular it's like they pre they essentially pre-planned and pre-designed the ability to add to it later down the road which is almost always good yes uh, so yeah, big nut about that. Also, and this is obviously a small bonus, but still kind of fun. You get to add fun, flavorful art to all the cards. Yeah. Yes. Just like Magic the Heather. <laughs> so yeah. Um, I actually want to. Uh, what do they see? Oh, yeah, and that I, I mentioned this already, but how the game really is expecting to be people's kind of first non D game. Uh, so it's it's teach. It does try to teach itself uh, as, you know, this is how we're different, but it doesn't seem like the game is trying to be. This is the first role playing game I've ever played type game. Yeah. OK, there's, there's a huh? there's a part of it that feels like that normally when you're like when you're making a new tabletop game and you want to get people into it, you want to, uh-huh. you obviously you want to hook new people. Yes. But with the, with Daggered Heart, like you said, it seems like this is aiming towards people who've already been in the tabletop sphere. Yes. Slash. Hey, the people who watch critical role, who also got into five E because of yes. critical role play our new game. Yes. And it's like not even trying to go for new people. Just they're trying to go after their own audience, which it makes sense. But it's I, also it's it's also a very weird thing from a marketing or anybody trying to sell something kind of deal. You know? Well, I, I, yeah. I don't actually think it is. Hold on, it, it was because so, um, they're relying on word of mouth, which For sure it might not be the most effective way of doing things nowadays, but it is a pretty damn good way of getting things done, right? They're they're really trying to push Daggerheart to, and I agree with you to the critical role crowd. The critical role crowd will spread out and go, oh, well, have you tried this new game? And someone's like, eh, I don't really know. Like, I kind of already have D&D. And then they go, no, 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 no. Like, I get it because it is like D&D, but it does have all these really cool things and it lets you be really creative. 
like it, it's it's uh basically free advertising from the fans yeah i mean and the way they like, I, I came think... out with the open beta was super smart like they had the website ready yeah, they had the nexus ready sick. Yeah, they had amazing open the data. videos. Yeah. Then they promoted a live stream on their yep. ninth year anniversary. Like they, like I, as much as I, I like the MSCDM, like what they did, and they're like here's the Kickstarter, we're building up to it. Oh, the Kickstarter is here. Then we're gonna do a bunch of videos explaining the rules of how we're making the game. I feel like this should be the blueprint now for like any company making, you know, a tabletop game or a new addition or whatever the hell follow this yeah, formula it, it, it's it's so it is the gold smart. standard for sure it's so smart uh, yeah. from a from a yeah from the standpoint of a like purely just marketing and excitement uh i like concept they the excitement and, and everything just it it dropped and it, they dropped a lot and you had a bunch of stuff to sink your teeth into right away like yeah it was it, it was very smart and i, I even literally said when the when the PDF dropped, I say PDF. When the, all of the PD, you know, it's a lot of PDFs too. It's like it's all the player classes have their own sheets. There's the start here. There's mm -hmm. the quick start adventure. The the rules itself, the GM materials. Like it's they dropped a ton of shit. Yeah. And when it dropped, I was like, oh, this is way more than I was expecting to get. Like way more. I was expecting it to be like a quick start guide size situation and it is not that it is a full game with everything you need to play right off the bat yeah because probably people sick. are so used to the other play test material from yeah. wizards or exactly. tales of the valiant yeah. or mcdm where they're like here's a packet here's a small pdf here's this and they're like yeah fuck, uh, here's the whole game i don't know uh, <laughs> Go <let's> crazy. Know. <laughs> well like, and a lot of games <laughs> a lot of games have quick start guides but the mm -hmm. quick start guides are very short small truncated rules that is not the entire game you know yeah like you can play the quick start but you can only play the quick start for a couple of sessions before you're going to be like okay where's the rest of the game i now want more you know it's a demo mm -hmm. i expected this to be more of a demo uh but they took the term open beta very literally <laughs> they were yeah, like no 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 correct. open beta <laughs> you're like okay sick with that in mind I am a little bit worried to see how much changes from, you know, you know, point, you know, 0 0.8, whatever, whatever we're at right now, whatever this version of the, the right, game right. is at to 1.0. I like, you know, there, there are some concrete things that aren't going to change. Obviously domain cards aren't going anywhere. There's too much work put into them. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure. You know, the classes aren't going anywhere. There's put too much work into them. But like the actual flow of the game, I feel like might change things like damage threshold, which, yes, it's already on the character sheets, but that's that's changeable. That's still changeable. That's, right? that's not like a concrete yeah. function of the game yet. They can always I'm simplify interested it. and a little scared. Yeah, a little scared to see how much of that is going to change. I'm excited for it, but I'm also like uh, this could this this could be a pretty drastic upheaval if if um, I... opinions don't come in super great. Oh, so you're yeah. worried? You're worried it's going to get changed too much? Is that what well, you're so I, I'm, what I'm saying is that that I think there are certain things that I want changed, and I'm not even going as far as to say the things I want changed are the right things to change. Uh -huh. But I think, mm. based on how much they've given us, how much they've allowed us to interact with, they now have to fight, uh, fight what the fuck, strike a fine line. <laughs> between keeping things and removing things because now mm -hmm. if they change too much we we've we've gotten a peek behind the curtain right right you know, people might be like well this isn't ju this just isn't the same game now um where if True. they don't change enough then people will be like well it still has like this this and this problem and now we're just gonna have to live with that i think at least until the next edition i, know. I think the thing they're kind of banking on or, or, or the not banking on, but the idea they're going for is if overall subs, uh, if overall reception is really, really good, then we know to stay course. And if overall perception is really, really negative, then we know we need to make big, huge changes and they're going to kind of gauge based on that. And yeah. I think they're in, they are in a modular enough position right now that they could swing it pretty effectively either way. And I think be all right. I think the only thing that I see in the game that seems 
pretty locked in and like going to be really hard to deal with if people don't jive with it is the domain cards. But I've also heard literally no one complain about it. So, no. Yeah, no, I haven't either. And because it's great. It's a fantastic it's idea. Yeah. Um, so I, if it, I'm sorry. I was just going to. So, like, I, I think they're in a good position in mm. terms of how how a beta could potentially go. Yeah. And they're not even looking for a release window till some point 2025, which, you know, would be their 10 year anniversary. Yeah. So why not release if they're going to release the whole product by then or launch a Kickstarter for it? Because why wouldn't you launch a Kickstarter or back? If they will, to be honest, they should like, yeah, I don't know. We'll see un- unless they they have. I mean, it's critical role. They have the resources, but like unless they want to pull the Candela Obscura and just say, fuck it, we release it because we're now a, a game publisher. Yeah. Like why? I can't. Yeah. Why wouldn't you do a backer kit? Um, because sometimes doing a Kickstarter or a backer kit, uh, crowdfunding sometimes makes people wary. Like crowdfunding can be True. really, really good and effective. Mm-hmm. Obviously, if you're like you know in an MCDM position, for example. Um, but sometimes people see crowdfunding go up and they get worried that oh. They must be having trouble because they're now they're asking for money when they weren't before. You know, it, it, guess, can, yeah. it can be a little bit of a shot in the foot, like from a sort of marketing standpoint. So I've, they might not. It depends on what they're looking at business wise, like how they're doing business wise. You know, I, I feel like, though, with the tabletop, because I don't know if you guys look at a lot of Kickstarters like I do, but like when not it comes to the, the when it comes to the tabletop Kickstarter like sphere. Yeah. It's all positive. Like mo- you like I've never seen a you know unless it's like something crazy like uh what was that one page thing like goblin with a fat ass goblins with a fat ass like unless it's like a meme thing where it's like you know back my kickstart goblins with a fast ass a uh, fat ass I need at least 100 million dollars and then it somehow makes it and then it only releases the one page and everyone <laughs> got fucking gypped like you don't see a lot of those scams when it comes at least to the tabletop yeah, uh, Kickstarters. I, I don't think people and would especially be... Critical Role having one of the highest and most successful Kickstarters when it comes to their animation series. True. That they then later pitch to Amazon. True. Like, I did actually. I forgot they kickstarted the end. So you would think like the two big things would be like, you know, positivity in the tabletop Kickstarter sphere. Critical Role being super successful with Kickstarter in general equals they should just do the Kickstarter for this because it's a win-win. You do got to keep in mind though, too, with a Kickstarter though, a Kickstarter (laughs) also assumes that you're, you're promising the product and more. So if If you already stretch goals, I don't think you can do one without you can. And you. Yeah. Okay. Well, culture, culturally people assume if you're doing a Kickstarter, that if you go beyond your base goal, you're going to add even more to the game. So, f- like, you know, from a cultural standpoint, if you're sitting there and going, well, we already have the money to pay for it. We don't want to try and be beholden to any extra stuff if we don't have to. And if you don't do a Kickstarter, you can control the like drip feed of information a little bit more, you know, like there are benefits to not doing it. So it, it, it depends on where they're sitting with the whole situation. But I, I, I wouldn't be surprised either way. Like if they did one, I wouldn't be surprised if they didn't do one. I wouldn't be that surprised, you know? Yeah, because I do want I wonder how much Candela Obscura has made. sold well. Or made. Like not even. Yeah, I guess money made. But like, I just want to know, is it been a positive experience have people actually like dug into the game played it a lot or people like has it become like you know when the roll 20 chart comes out yeah is it going to be up there or is it going to fill in with the rest of the games that aren't 5e i haven't Cult of looked, Cthulhu? i haven't looked at candle obscura much myself um i don't know but i i do know that candela obscura was intended to be a much smaller game it was sort of intended to be like you play like every time you play candela obscura it's you know a one to three shot type endeavor uh and the game itself is is more bite-sized so i wouldn't be surprised if it if 
it had sort of a, a smaller impact in comparison to what I think Daggerheart, which they literally have said themselves, is intended to be like a big long campaign type game. You know, they intend yeah. for you to play it for a year or whatever. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, Where the heck were we? <laughs> the domain. Domain cards. Yeah, ah, so... Okay. The initiative players. system, uh, action economy yeah. thing. What I'm were you saying, gonna... Sorry. I, no, I was just going over the list and seeing where we were. The pretty much oh, I'm sorry. I thought, I thought you, were, you were trying to say something about it. So no, no. this, uh, I would. Okay. Um, oh, we didn't say we were. this was going to be a two-parter. This is going to be a two-parter. Uh, no, no. I'm going to have. No, I did at the beginning. Did you? Yeah. Okay. I didn't remember. All right. So uh, I will have more to say about the action economy initiative system on the GM side because the GM side is where more of my frustration lies because this initiative action token system is one of the clunky parts of the game that I am frustrated with but the game does not use rounds or actions or anything like that Uh, the game follows the flow of the fiction just in the same way that an apocalypse world, a dungeon world, a blades in the dark, any basically any PBT TA game, same style. There is no difference between combat and doing regular actions. Everything is just making skill checks, whether it's an attack or not. It's all the same idea. And there's no specific turns or initiative roles or anything like that. There is more to it than that. Like I said, I will. I, I think I want to get more into it on the GM side of things. Um, but as it is in the game right now, the way the action tracker works, I am not crazy about. I don't know where you two lie on. Yeah, that. I'm not. No, I'm not either. It it. I'm not going to go as far as to say that it's purposefully misleading it feels a little it is absolutely well no yeah it it feels misleading but i I don't i'm gonna give them the benefit of the doubt and say that they didn't do it on purpose right right um because i know because i read it right because it's like oh there is no initiative and then you read further on it's like well there kind of is kind of sort of an initiative from a certain point of view like it's like you can just say like or not even you can just say you could have just kept it the power by the apocalypse you go, bad guy goes. Yes. You go, bad guy goes. Like, see, <sighs> yeah, go around the ring or table. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Well, the thing is, is like it feels like they're trying to Brit. They're trying to be in between. They're like, they're trying to make a spot in between Dungeon World and D and D. And I, I just don't. Why. Like, I don't I don't get what you're like. I don't get what the benefit is. I don't see a, the pro, the pros do not see. It seems like the cons are outweighing the pros, you know, maybe they're just trying to do something <laughs> new. And, you know, yeah. obviously the community has spoken and said no. Yeah, it's like they're trying to yeah. do something new, but oh, the execution just feels all over the place. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm going to keep it a buck. I, you could have done anything like. You could have done the the index card RPG and been like, your initiative is whoever sits a certain way at the table, right? Like that you feels just go like that would have fit this better, and you have the action t- <laughs> tracker, and there you go. It would, yeah, it would have been simpler. Like it just would. Like, yeah, well, because the thing is, is like, right? So in a, in a Powered by the Apocalypse game, a player does an action, the GM reacts to player actions. That's always how those games. You know, that's basically how all those games work. I'm, there's probably some out there that have like different initiatives, but for the most part, most powered by the apocalypse games, that's the vibe. You know, the goblin attacks you player. What do you do? I, you know, I try to strike the goblin back. All right. You get a seven to nine result, which is a middling success. You deal a blow to the goblin. The goblin mm-hmm. hits you in the in the leg with his knife and then rolls under your legs and ends up behind you. What do you do next? You know? It's all reactionary. Blades in the dark, same deal. Player makes a roll. GM looks at the roll, responds. 
I, it's like w that works good and it, that is a no initiative system because I get they don't want to have an initiative system that that already is a no initiative system and then they throw in this action tracker action token thing and it's like okay we don't have initiative but the GM kind of has so like the player side players definitely have no form of initiative right players just get to do what they want to do they describe what they're doing fictionally but the gm kind of has gm turns so it's like players don't have initiative but gm has initiative sort of mm. sort of yeah and and i i know i said at the beginning that i like asynchronous design between gm and player side and i do this, I think, is just not a good execution of the asynchronous design, you know? So, and also, let me just say, reading through the PDF, uh, reading through the GM section, which I was literally doing this morning, it's also worded very confusingly. Now, some of this might be some editing pass because there's a couple of things I saw that confused me that I think were typos, but I'm not 100% sure. So it's also worded in a way that I was a little confused and so it makes it me sitting there. I'm like, if I want to run this, which I do, I'm going to have to kind of square the circle and, and make the flow make sense for me, at least for the time being. And that's a little annoying. It's also it's yeah. also kind of a symptom. So another thing I think that's worth pointing out hmm. in Apocalypse World and Dungeon World, uh, monsters don't roll. The GM does not roll dice. In Dungeon World, you roll damage dice. Uh, in Apocalypse World, you don't roll any dice ever. Damage are set numbers. Enemies don't roll or have stats. Players do all the rolling. In Daggerheart, that's true 90% of the time, but enemies do make attack rolls. And they do make reaction rolls, which are saves. So... Most of the time in Daggerheart, you don't roll. But then when the enemies are attacking on the GM turn, then you are making rolls. And I think that's also part of the clunkiness is. They're like, oh, it's an asynchronous design where the GM doesn't roll dice the way the players do. Except for this one small chunk of the game where the GM does roll dice and then also the GM rolls a D20, which I thought was really odd. The players. Yeah, I, I couldn't quite figure out why, why? they ran, rolled a D20. Yeah. So GM, the way monsters work when they attack is a, the GM rolls a D20 and adds the monster's attack bonus, which the attack bonus, the idea of simplifying the monsters down to just one attack bonus, as opposed to having a bunch of stats. I'm fine with that. I've seen other games do that. The uh, stars without number does that works great. Uh, but yeah, you roll a d20 and add the monster's attack bonus, and that's how you determine if the monster hits the player's evasion score or not. But why is it not just the same 2d12 mechanic? And yeah, it it's weird. Why wouldn't they just drop most of the dice and just either do the... Isn't Dungeon World only d6? Uh, right? Not so... No? Or uh, one of the other so games Dungeon is World D6. is 2d6 for your moves and then you would roll damage dice but other than damage dice yes it's always 2d6 like I'm surprised like the entire game isn't just a bunch of d6s D or these D12s. d6s and d12s yeah. and that's it yeah well I kind of understand it for damage dice on like weapons and stuff because you want some of that granularity that different die types can get you so th there I get it but yeah having Having the different di different dice between the GM and the players just feels a little odd. I, I, I especially because most of the game the GM isn't rolling. You know, like mm -hmm. most of your play, you're not making rolls, and then combat happens. The players attack somebody, and now you are making rolls. Fe that feels odd to me. It feels not. Uh, kind of not smooth you know so yeah. yeah i agree i i don't and the the problem so the other problem though is 
I don't even know exactly how they would tackle this issue because a lot of the monster's abilities, their moves, uh, trigger based on the action tracker system. And how much, and like they all cost a certain amount of it'll fear. It'll say, yeah, it'll say like this monster. Well, so the fear is, the fear is separate, which oh. was another thing that confused me, by the way. So fear tokens and action tokens, not related. You can spend fear tokens to give yourself action tokens, but you can't use fear tokens at, like as action tokens. Oh, oh, what the shit? Yeah. They're not the same thing. Oh, I thought they were. That's why I was like, no. oh, okay, that makes sense. No, oh, okay. they're, I That's thought they were at first, too. They're not. Right. Right. Yeah. So, like, for example, because the thing is, you can get you can um, accrue fear tokens anytime the players roll. Right. So players make a, you know, make a roll to kick a door down. They r succeed with fear. You as a GM get a fear token. Once a, uh, once a situation happens that would be, you know, once a fight breaks out or something equivalent to a fight, it doesn't necessarily have to be a fight, but it's like a high action scene of some kind, you know? Um, that's when the GM pulls out the action tracker. And when a player does something, you put an action token on the tracker. So one player is like, I attack the goblin action token another player is like i attack the orc action token another player is like i ready this spell and blow the door open action token then the gm says all right i'm now gonna spend some action tokens to have my monsters do some stuff but it's not fear they're action tokens but what you do is i'm gonna spend an action token to have this monster do something and then i'm gonna spend a fear to activate his special ability as part of it so it's two separate pools that you're paying attention to right to give you an example I have the master assassin stat block open they have an ability called coupe de grace when a master success assassin successfully makes a serrated dagger attack against a target that is vulnerable spend fear to deal damage equal to the target's major threshold plus 2d8 so you spend fear to like do a bigger hit. That's separate from the action token that you would have spent to make him do to make him start his turn. Right. Did I explain that? Yes. Yeah. Mm. yeah. <laughs> Even no, as I'm talking I mean, about it, my brain is like, is that how that works? <laughs> so. Yeah, <laughs> it just. It's just weird. I just don't understand what the token system what the benefit of it is, but it's also flip a token. It's also now it's kind of baked. The, the problem is it's kind of baked into the monster mechanics is the token system. So it's going to be tricky to rework. Yeah, not impossible, of course, but tricky. Yeah, that's all that. I think this is going to be a, another one of the I think this is going to be like, I mean, like Matt said, the other big point of contention people have mentioned is this initiative system. Um, although the thing I've heard is that some people are having an issue with the initiative system because they don't like the free forminess of it. And that's not my problem with it at all. I like the free forminess. I think my problem is it's not free form enough. Kind of. Yeah, it's, it, they didn't commit to it enough. They, they were yeah. trying to kind of get the best of both yeah. and ended up with the worst of both. <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, we tried. It's like this weird half measure thing that just makes you go, OK, it almost makes me feel like they should have just done Fantasy Flight Star Wars initiative system. I was going to bring up Fantasy Flight because it <laughs> works really well. Yep. You roll initiative. Yep. The players get to pick what their initiative is based on what they rolled. So, like, if I rolled the best, Josh can take my initiative slot and I can take his slot because he sets up defensive fields and I shoot the gun. Yep. Like, yeah, because there's no there's no uh, initiative in that game is not per character. It's just so everyone rolls initiative and they're three three separate instances of pc initiative and then there's npc initiative and it bounces back and forth so for example two characters roll i i forget what die you even use for initiative but two characters roll or, or how you count your initiative oh it's number of successes i think i don't know it doesn't matter uh two characters roll 
uh, two of the PCs roll, you know, initiative slot one and two. An NPC gets initiative slot three. A PC gets initiative slot four. Turn one rolls around. The PCs go, okay, who wants to go first? It can be any one of them. Turn two goes around. around. It can be any other PC other than the one that just went. NPC goes and then back to a PC slot. The last person who hasn't gone, they go. So you can still have that free form of whoever wants to go can go. But uh, it's it's slightly less free form than something like Dungeon World because you are still limited to like actions per turn in Star Wars. Uh, but it's it's easier to understand and still gives you some of that free form, like some of that ability to choose who goes when and do combos and stuff. Mm. So, yeah, mm. yeah, <laughs> it kind of feels like that maybe should have been a better move. It's like either do it like Fantasy Flight Star Wars or commit wholly to how Dungeon World does it. But this kind of in between right now, I ain't about it. It ain't it, Chief. <laughs> this, this ain't it. Okay. Uh, critical successes we talked about. Uh, fun little critical Pretty success. Good. Proficiencies I mentioned. I still think it is a little weird that the only place I see proficiency come up is damage. I feel like it must come up somewhere else, but I've only see it come up in damage. So I'm I'm, I'm going to keep it a buck. I, I did know. a quick skim through uh, control effing. Yeah. And uh, didn't I didn't only damage, right? I think so. Yeah. I thought that was interesting. Um, oh, that being said, though, speaking of damage, the critical damage rules. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Did you guys read how those work? Yeah, so you you um you roll your damage and then you just set extra damage aside. That's the max of whatever your dice roll is, right? Yes. So for example, if your damage was 2d6, you would roll your initial attack of 2d6 damage. So let's say you get like a 3 and a 4, so that's 7. You would that de- you then automatically add 12 because the highest possible value of 2d6 is 12. So it's seven plus 12. So your crit always does at least your maximum damage plus one. Always. Even if you rolled incredibly shitty, like even if you roll a D12 and you get a one, you still get the 12 from the crit. So you always at least do max damage plus one. So crits are never big sedge because you rolled a two. (laughs) You know? Um... Yeah, I'm I'm very happy with that. Yeah, I, uh, love it. Big fan. It's, it's one of the actually. It's one of the things that I don't like about Lancer is that crits don't feel very good. I forget how they work, but I think I do remember them being kind of meh. For, uh, I forget exactly how it works, but I do remember reading it. I, oh no, I literally like I don't like them, and now I can't fucking. Remember how <laughs> I can't remember how it works. I, I mean, yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Um, I don't know what it is, but I don't like it. Yeah. Uh, there's reaction. So reaction rolls are a thing. They're just saving throws. Oh, they are. Nothing fancy. Um, the only thing that's a little different is that like you're saving. There's no difference between reaction rolls and regular character trait rolls. It's the same bonus and stuff. So in, you know, D&D, you have like saving throw proficiencies and skill proficiency. They're not separated like that. So if you roll with strength, you get a plus two. If you make a reaction roll with strength, you get a plus two. It's the same number. Oh, real quick. I just, I remembered it now. Um, it yeah. Mm-hmm. So if, for Lancer, let's say if you roll, we're going to keep the 2d6. Yep. So if you roll a crit and Lancer, you roll 4d6 and then you just take the bigger result of the. Damage. That's right. That's right. You take you get advantage. Uh, you get yeah advantage on your damage. That's oh, right. What the heck? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I usually I because I'm going to be running this game. I'm usually the person who's like, don't change things until you know how they work. That's almost some, certainly something I'm just going to change. <laughs> I mean, I think that it's OK. It's not the worst way to do it because it does guarantee to get like a better result. But yeah, but it doesn't like it, it's never going to number not go bigger. Like, yeah, critical hit number go bigger. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That does feel like how crit should feel. It's number go bigger. <laughs> Um, yeah, almost certainly one of the things I'm probably going to change. 
Uh, I have evasion noted down here. Eva- like I said, already said, evasion is AC. That's all it is. Yeah. AC. Uh, it works identical. Advantage and disadvantage, basically the same as 5e, um, except it's d6s uh, that you add on top of your roll as opposed to doubling up your d12s. And they can stack up and cancel each other out. So, like, if you have three advantage and two disadvantage, you, you know, one disadvantage cancels out and you have an advantage. Um, I don't think you can stack up multiple advantages or disadvantages, though. I didn't see anything about that. So I don't think you can add like three D6 or anything. Uh, So I do not believe so. Yeah, nothing, nothing fancy there. Um, Range uh, range increments are handled a la Apocalypse World. You have range bands, so you have melee very close, close, far, very far. Um, let me just say, I like these word. I like the word choices for those a lot better um, because Dungeon World and Apocalypse World use it's like close, near, far, extreme or something like that. And I just always forget which ones are which, particularly between like near and far. For some reason, my brain gets those confused. But mm. melee, close, very like melee, very close and close. I I can't fuck those up in my head. <laughs> so I like mm-hmm. those. There's five range distances. Nice and straightforward. Um, I like that for, in the uh, in the starter video too, or no, it was it was the the first video they released where they like how to play. Yeah, they really like you know, like far is if you're using a table or uh, you know gridded minis. He's like it's the size of a pencil very far is the size of a piece of paper and i'm like wow that that's actually super easy to follow <laughs> yes it's it's easy to follow yeah i <laughs> it felt very warhammer it yeah yeah <laughs> it does it does feel very warhammer i don't even know that they necessarily needed to to bring that up because they also mentioned like very far is this many feet to this many feet i don't even know that you really need to mention that because honestly as someone who's played a lot of Apocalypse World, for example, there's never been a situation where the the range description words were not enough. Like, I never said to the GM, okay, uh, what range is he at? Oh, he's close. Okay, but like, how many feet? I'd be like, I don't know, he's just close. But how many feet? You obviously like, never played a rogue. I never once had that problem. I'd just be like, oh, he's close. Okay, so I can shoot him because my pistol has a range of close. That's all I need to know. You know what I mean? Like if the game doesn't use bespoke measurements, then you don't need to describe the bespoke measurements because the game doesn't care about them. You know what I mean? Like mm. they just don't, they don't matter. So it, it mm. feels a little weird that they bothered to take the time to explain them. But I guess if you're trying to appease the D and D people who think you need those numbers for some reason, because I've heard people say you need those numbers then whatever, fine, appease them a little. I, I've heard people that's say such a that's that's such a funny take. Like yeah. you know, you need exact bespoke yes. numbers. It's like you really don't. Why? I've heard people say like, that it. I've heard people say it's more confusing and harder to use the range descriptors than it is to use five foot increments. Like, I it it really isn't my guy. I've played plenty of if, games. Well, so that here's the funny thing. A, if you think about it. <laughs> They're just simplified uh-huh. range increments. Uh-huh. So rather than 5, 10, 15, you have melee close near. Correct. It's the same shit. It's the same like, thing. I, it is the same thing, Isaiah. Yes, it is. <laughs> Absolutely. All masses. I know. I know. <laughs> I feel you, bud. <laughs> yep. Uh, I know. It's, it's, I, I, when I hear, I, you know what? You know why I was seeing? I was seeing people mention, I was seeing people uh, say something about it because Shadow the Weird Wizard when that was coming out or when that came out uh in the, early on that game said it wasn't going to use bespoke measurements and then the game came out and it does and i was like mm. oh i'm really disappointed and multiple people replied like no it's way better with the feet measurements and i'm like it just isn't my guy <laughs> it just isn't i I've, I've played with and without no <laughs> i also i don't know this for a fact 
but I'd be willing to bet money that these days there's more games that don't use bespoke measurements than do. You know what I'm saying? Well, you know what's funny? I don't. I actually like having. Like, I wouldn't necessarily say that a game is better or worse for having them or not having them, but it, it really like D and D, despite what it says, is kind of a crunchy game. So I think D and D works far better with those measurements because a lot of things rely on those measurements, and so, in so turn, those measurements rely on a bunch of different things themselves. But well, the but the, if you're building a ground from if you're building a game from the ground up to be a simplified game, you don't add them. And if someone is like, no, no, it's better if you add them, then you go, but no, but it literally isn't, though, because a lot of these mechanics revolve around, you know, a pro like uh, uh, loose approximations. If you want to add the like specific, appro uh, you know, sorry, specifics, not approximations, you just gunk up the works, you know? Yes. Well, and the, the, the only reason you care about five foot increments in D&D &D is because the game describes everything in those five foot increments so you have to know what they are because that's how the game describes things if the game didn't describe them that way you wouldn't care you know what i mean like mm -hmm. the only reason i care if the enemy is 30 feet away is because the range of my spell is 30 feet if the range of my spell was close i wouldn't ask how many feet it was because i don't need to know <laughs> uh, yeah anyway um Ooh, okay. Oh, Isaiah, did you see this part? This probably this bugged me, and I'm sure this will bug you if you didn't see this. There's no pricing for any equipment <laughs> at all. I did see that. Lamau. Yeah. Yeah. The gold system yep. in this yep. game yep. is yep. fucking yep. weird. Well, so the gold system is fine. I'm fine with because it's just abstracted amounts of gold, which is something. But I don't like that. Well, it's something Blades in the Dark does, and it works fine. It works perfectly good. Uh, the Yeah, the, the game just assumes you have the money to buy the things you need when you need them. For basic stuff. And then if you're buying, fan for basic stuff, for yeah. buying fancy stuff, you use the mechanical, actual uh, money system. So, like, you know, it, the way it works, for those listening, the way it works in Daggerheart, it's just gold is abstracted into, uh, you have handfuls of gold bags of gold chest hordes and fortunes uh five handfuls equals a bag four bags gets you a chest three chests get you a hoard two hordes get you a fortune so essentially if you're ever in a situation where you would mark off a sixth handful of gold you upgrade it to a bag of gold if you're ever in a situation where you would mark off a fifth bag of gold you upgrade it to a chest of gold that's it. It's just simple abstraction. Uh, it doesn't it doesn't matter the exact amounts that I'm cool with. I like that. But the fact that none of the equipment has any pricing, not even suggested pricing that I'm not that that I was like, why? Yeah, well, because so it, it what else are you going to be spending money on? I don't know. That's yeah, if not your equipment. Right. Which means that the having gold is completely irrelevant because there's like well, it, the way the book phrases it is that we're not going to tell you how much things cost, but your GM is going to decide and then make you spend gold on that. I don't want to. I don't want to either. <laughs> my, my, I feel like I feel like a perfectly reasonable solution to this, because I kind of understand the idea of like, we don't want to tell you exactly how much everything costs because the game doesn't have a setting so you know a sword might cost might be more expensive in your setting than it would be in ours because there's no preset setting i understand that the the problem is that you gave no guidance at all so i'm working totally blind so i feel like an easy yeah. solution here would have just been you have a table and the table says, uh, you know, let's say it says low fantasy, medium fantasy, high fantasy. And it says if your setting is low fantasy, medium set, whatever, and then give suggested prices for each of the items in those types of, of setting. So it'll say like a broadsword in a low fantasy game cost, you know, four handfuls of gold. A broadsword in a high fantasy game cost two handfuls of gold. Just give suggested you know, because 
This is usually what sci-fi games do, right? Because a sci-fi game will be like, oh, things don't cost the same price on every planet. So what they'll do is they'll give you a modifier table. They'll be like, if this planet is low tech then stuff like a laser gun, you modify the price by, you know, two times, three times its normal price, right? If something's higher tech, you sub- you divide the price by something by however much because you're on a high tech planet, right? Like sci-fi games run into this problem a lot. Just give me something like that. They, they just, actually they fix this in Lancer hilariously enough. They For just the gave part, they a, it. They just gave you nothing. <laughs> How did they fix it in Lancer? Yeah, and so know. in uh, so in Lancer, if you is if you're on a core world or a union world, there is no currency because there's fabricators. You just walk up to a fabricator and go, "I want a gun." Oh, you just get a gun. Yeah, yeah, that's like setting um, specific stuff. Uh, yeah, well, so but like they they specifically say for most places you don't need money. You just go there and get that thing because there's no want for anything. There's no need for money. But if you're in like a like a fucking middle of nowhere world, you use something called mana, which is just a a nebulous currency. And that's where they're kind of like, well, you have to figure it out based on what people like. They're basically like if you're on a desert planet, you know, things are probably going to be like more expensive, like, you know, foodstuffs will be more expensive. Uh, if you're like somewhere on like a like a verdant planet, so I, I don't remember what they use for that one. They talk about this though. Right. Um, like if you do need to use pricing, you can. But there you can run a whole game of Lancer in Union Worlds and never have to spend a dime on anything. Right. But the, the those little suggested like if you're on this type of planet, do X. That that's all I want from Daggerheart. Just give me something like that, and I'll be happy. Hmm. But they didn't. Get, they just said. F- they just said we're not going to give you any pricing or suggestions and i was like uh okay so that that i was not cool with felt almost a little lazy uh Uh, i'm not gonna lie i agree (laughs) um i don't know matt i assume you're on the same page on that one yeah good I mean, there's a there's a whole reason the uh, was it the Sane's magic item PDF right, is so right, popular right. for for the yeah, DMG yeah, yeah. for the pricing. Yeah, yeah. Pe- people want to know the prices of magic item and wizards. They've been slowly adding the prices for certain magic items, but yeah. um, they're like, no, just here, roll the Xanathar's guide thing. And I'm like, no, no wizards, I want exact. <laughs> uh. Um. I noted down uh, the the resting system. I like it's fun. Uh, you can get three short rests per per day. After you've done three short rests, you have to take a long rest. I think that's fine, just because there's no other way to limit short rests. There's no other like hit dice or anything like that. So yeah, limiting in that set fashion, I think is fine. Um, and I like that you have to pick two options when you rest. So you could potentially rest and like not heal your HP if you don't need to which I think is fun. You could like clear stress and like prepare, which I believe gets you a hope. If I remember correctly, when you prepare something like that yes. or like work on a project or yeah, if you're doing a long rest, repair you can work on a project, armor. repair your armor. armor. Yeah. Stuff like that. I think you can like make a potion too. If I'm not, I could be wrong. Uh, that would probably just be the long, the long-term project thing. Mm. Yeah. That's just a fun one. Yeah. Nice yeah, and straightforward. Cool. Happy with that. And then there's the death moves. Uh, I like the death moves. I don't know about you guys. I think they're pretty fun. Um, I don't have a problem with the death moves specifically. I do have a problem with the, um, the way not dying is handled. If you're knocked down to zero hit point, if you like, quote unquote, if you avoid death with consequence, I don't like that. Yeah. The star system. Yeah. So to explain real quick, there's three options for when you die. You can embrace death and go out in a blaze of glory, which is just you do something before your character dies and it's an automatic critical success. Uh, So you do one last cool thing. You can avoid death and face the consequences. Uh, Your character drops unconscious and then they get scarred in some way. Um, And or you can risk it all, which is where you roll your duality dice and then if your hope is higher, you stay on your feet and clear some hit points and stress. If your fear is higher, you die. If you crit, you get all of your HP and stress back and you're just fucking back in it, ready to go, which I think that one I think is particularly fun. The risk it all where it's like, there's a chance I come back full swinging, baby. <laughs> um, 
I do like that one. I, that one's I, fun. I think that, that one's one big makes fun. sense to me where it's it's a gamble and they made the gamble high stakes. I it's, do appreciate yeah, that one. Big gamble. Yeah. Big gamble time. Gamba. The scar one. So like, wait. So yeah. So the scar one, uh, if you roll, you drop unconscious, you then roll your fear die. If its value is equal to or under your level, take a scar. May not take any actions while you're unconscious. Uh, when you have any number of your marked hit points cleared by an ally or on your next party's next long rest, return to consciousness. Uh, a scar, if you take a scar, decreases the amount of total hope you can have. That's it. So normally yeah, and then you have you... a max hope of five. You take one scar, it goes down to four. And if you yes, lose I all don't five, like then your character is basically forced retired. Yeah. Uh, yes. What is the part you don't like? Uh, so they're obviously t- trying to take from the trauma system in Blades, which I like yeah, a lot. Yeah, because traumas, uh, they they give you like specific character quirks. Yeah, traumas are words in Blades. They're specific fra- yeah. words. Yes, such as and, cold and they do have like haunted. a loose mechanical thing. Yeah, but you know it's like oh, doing this kind of thing will be more difficult. The issue with the scars is that they directly affect how much hope you can have, which means the more times you get knocked down, the less effective you are until you are very ineffective because you only have one hope slot, which just means that it it gets to a point where it's just not worth playing that character again mechanically. You know, like once you get down to two hope slots, you might as well just retire the character anyway because you have no like you, your clips empty you've got nothing to use i hesitate to say it is, if it's not worth playing that character but i get what you mean it, it it yeah it is kind of a death spiral punishment at a certain um honestly though your comparison to blades i think the thing about blades is the blades traumas are just more fun <laughs> mm. no they are they're, they are more fun but they're just they're just less punishing overall like well, the thing that's there, fun about the Blades ones, too, is, right, so if your character goes down and you take a trauma, your character, you can, one of the ones you could take could be reckless. And then if you play into the fact that your character is reckless, you actually earn XP. So, yes, it's it's a fun fictional thing as well as a mechanical thing. So I think that's the part that makes it particularly cool. And yeah, I would like I would like yeah, I don't know. Just taking away the hope, I do. I did kind of want the scars to do something else. Maybe just give you the option to dock more things. Like you could choose hope or HP or stress. Like one less HP, one less stress, one less hope. Like give you the option to dock other stuff. Maybe that's yeah. The move. I could see that. I just I just don't want it to have an effect on how effective my character can be. Unless it's like you lose a limb and then you can only use one weapon because you're still quite effective if you're only using one weapon. But to have it be like you got to have some kind of you got to have a punishment for going down those. You do. But you you would, though, if you used it like traumas, it changes the way you you role play the game and the game is touting itself as a very role play heavy game. So affect yes, the only thing is zero in on that and really go for it. The only thing with traumas is you don't have to play into them as a choice, although it does incentivize. You, obviously, it, 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 yeah, I would say it does incentivize you, but I, I, I don't even necessarily think you should be punished for going down that hard mm. because that gives the DM a lot more leeway in how they want to run the game. I guess. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I don't know exactly. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Exactly that being said, though, I um, I've always been pretty vocal about don't like the like lingering injuries and shit. Don't pu- that's that should never be a punishment. That should be a play something a player wants to take to make their character more or you know more interesting, more dynamic. Yeah. So I I would be fine if they just didn't have the scars. If it was just like or or clear ones like so you know. Give us give us something else that makes you retire the character. I don't hate that. I think that's fine. Uh-huh. But make it like uh, uh, exhaustion, where the more times you go down. So let's say if you go down once a day, no matter what, you take a trauma. You can go down as much as you want after that. You won't gain any more traumas, 
but you will get like you'll you'll lose your hopes and then you take long rests and then you slowly get a hope back but your trauma still stays um yeah it's gonna work yeah could see that yeah I, I don't know I'd have to I think I'd have I'd have to workshop it in my brain what'd you say Matt probably you know play it out see how it yeah. works like in the field like in yeah. combat or over a long term yeah I do see what you mean though like it, it, at a certain point you have so little hope that you are punished you're not unplayable though like you could still do stuff you just don't have as much hope to burn I don't know well, it also so depends like, on the if you're value down to one hope, hope well like let's say you're playing a, a seraph and you're using or not a seraph you're using you're playing a guardian using hope a big part of using hope as a guardian is that you're adding to your armor, you're adding to your your mm. your allies' armor, and you're still a wall. But your ability to do what the, your character is supposed to do, which is defend your allies, yeah. you just sort of become ineffective at. Not useless, but you're not effective anymore. You're less effective because you're you don't. I wouldn't say you're totally. I, I don't, I, if you have one hope left, I'm going to go as far as to say you are ineffective. I don't. I'd, I'd have to play. I'd have to play enough to see that. I don't know if I. I don't know if I'd quite say that yet, but maybe. We also have to remember for a lot of your domain stuff, you have to burn a hope. You do, yeah. But you also the thing is, is if you even if you only have one po- point of hope, spend a point of hope, get it back, spend it, get it back. You know, there, there's still that. You know, because you can you're going to get it back fairly frequently. Yeah, from a lot of the videos, a lot of people were like saying after a combat or two, they were like, we have so much fear and hope token. Like DM's like, I have all this fear tokens yeah. and I didn't spend them all. Or like the players like being, I have max hope constantly. Uh, yeah. What do now? Well, because the thing you got to remember is that hope and fear is 50 50. Yeah. You either get one or the other every single roll. So you're always getting one or the other. There's no scenario where you don't get either. Which actually could be a flaw in the system potentially they may need that that may need to be considered so even if you're down to us you can only store one hope one point of hope on your character sheet you're gonna use it and get it back pretty frequently so i don't know that's what i mean we're like i'd have to see it like that's why i'm saying i'd have to see it play out because i really i'm not sure on how the economy would bounce back and forth in that scenario well, so I, I can give you one definitive one. When you play as a rogue, you pump hopes into your sneak attack to do more damage. You do, yes. So you can't Which, pump which is many. predicated on you having as many as you can. So if yes. you're a rogue with one hope left, your sneak attack gives you one extra die around. Right. So which you're, you're, you're less... Presumably, you're you're having... Well, hold let me just finish. Because at, at, like at higher levels, right, you're going to have... Um, you know, the stakes are going to start getting stacked. You're going to have to start dealing more damage as that rogue to make yourself to, to be able to be the DPS that you're supposed to be. And if you can't do that, why are you there? You know, like, well, again, I would definitely, the, I would call that not ineffective, but definitely less effective from like a math standpoint. You know what I mean? Like you are substantially less effective for sure, but you don't do nothing. You know, ineffective would imply like you do nothing. Well, no, in, like, you, well, to say or that you're useless nothing. means you do nothing. Ineffective means that you you are just not like you could be replaced by the bard and still do the same amount of damage. Yeah, I guess. I don't know. But we don't need to keep going down this path. Like I said, I, 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 I'm not going to say anything definitive on it. I would need to see more. Or I need to play it out more. Uh, Yeah, and, and then it's bouncing from the death stuff. Um, the game has a little section where it mentions that player player resurrection can be done by working with the GM, but the rules for that have not been made yet. It just says section pending. So we don't know what their ideas are going to be there yet. So we have nothing to say. We'll see when we get there. Uh, they do mention there's one resurrection spell in the game currently from the Splendor domain, which is the thing that, you know, clerics get or the seraphs. Uh, and it's a one-time use, so we know of at least one, but you do have to be max level to do it. So I'm imagining, if I were to take a guess, and I think a lot of people are probably going to make this assumption, that the resurrection thingy is probably going to be some sort of version of Matt Mercer's resurrection rules that they used in Critical Role. 
That's probably likely, yes. Huh? This is that's, that's likely, yes. Yeah, I mean, that'd be my guess. I don't know, Matt, if you have any tinfoil hat theories, but no, it, it makes the most sense. Makes the most, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it just makes the most sense. Uh, yeah. I hope they do. I hope they add to that little system. I hope they do something interesting with it. But yeah. Um, and then the last couple of things, leveling up. Josh is sad. It is amazing. Yeah, Josh is sad. Matt is happy. It's milestone. Bow, 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 it's dad, literally dad, dad. just boring ass milestone. Nothing different. Nothing changed. It's just a bargain bin. But Josh, we're already abstracting milestone. so many things. Might as well extract XP, huh? Bro, don't you start with me. <laughs> I swear <laughs> on my life. <laughs> How's it feel? You okay. know, honestly, I think the thing. Honestly, though, here's the thing. It annoys me. Because there's a lot of places that I in this game that I looked at and thought of, oh, you could you could give XP for that, or you could give XP for that, or you could give XP for like there's so many mechanics where I'm like, oh, you could give a point of XP for doing that. And mm -hmm. it's, it's nope, just milestone. Now I was we, like, okay. We don't we don't do that here. Like a great example. If you uh you know uh every if you roll with with hope five times a session, mark XP, you know, uh, if you fail, you know, if you fail with fear a number of times, you could mark XP, you know, Dungeon World gives you XP for failing. You know, if you, you know, I don't know. If you uh, once per roll session a or roll a crit or but even like if once per session, if you burn your. Uh, if you burn incoming damage all the way down below your minor threshold, you could like mark an XP. Like there's a lot of little places I saw some fun stuff that I don't know. I feel like you could lean into that. I, I would do something with the duality dice probably to really lean into that like heroic fantasy vibe. But yeah, no, they just did milestone. <laughs> they, yeah. Hooray. I Make was my very, life easier. I was very sad about that. I ain't gonna lie. I don't know about you, Isaiah, but. No, I was fine with it. I was like, all right, but yeah, <laughs> you know. I'm on my island. Uh, well, so like, I, I'm sort of the middle ground here. Uh, oh. Like, not I'm not even sitting on the fence. I just like, I like milestone. I like XP. I'm fine with both. I mean, hmm. uh, I will say I like the leveling up process. Uh, yeah, I like that all of your level up options are right there on your sheet, and I like that there lots. Of, I like what the options are. You can lots increase of choices, yeah. lots of choices, increase damage thresholds, your proficiency, your hit points, your stress, basically any of the numbers you would want to try and bump. You would want to potentially bump on your sheet. You can more or less. So happy with that. Um, and then multi-classing talking about leveling up. So you can only level up or you can only multi-class once you're level five. So once you get into tier two of the game uh, and multi-classing is pretty simple and the main benefit is you just add another domain card to your domains so for example you're a rogue so you have access to the midnight and grace domains and you say you know what i would like to have some cleric -y stuff so i'm gonna multi-class into serif and then you get access to the splendor domain um and that's the main benefit of multi-classing is you pick up a domain from the other class. You also pick up the level one abilities from that other class, but only the level one abilities. You don't get any of their higher up stuff because classes do have abilities that are tied specifically to the class. You do not get those if you multi-class, which I think makes a lot of sense. You get to have a little taste of the class, but you don't get the cooler abilities of the class because you're not fully in that class. So I think it's a pretty good way to do leveling up. Yeah. Or to do multi-classing, I mean. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I like it. And uh, and it, it's it's much in, and it is a, and it's also a very it's a much easier way to balance multi-classing because you can balance the domain. All of the domain cards presumably are already being balanced against each other. So a player being able to pick from another pool of domain cards is not going to completely upend the entire game. Like a certain other game, maybe, that we know of called D&D. Yeah, Pathfinder looking at you. I don't know if Pathfinder has issues with multi-classing. 
I actually have no idea. To be yeah, honest, I don't, I don't, don't know. have I don't know. class thing. I'm just fucking. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Well, so it, it's. I would. I don't know if I'd go as far as to call it a problem, but because Pathfinder is so heavily build specific, right? Like you have to really plan your build out beforehand. It is true. an integral part of it. True. That's true. Mm. Well, there's no multi-classing. They have like little feats. Like, I well, yeah, you have feet dipping essentially. Feet. Yeah. yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's basically you use feats to. I'm a wizard, and I can take the rogue feet, so yeah, now yeah. I can sneak attack or you know whatever. Right. Well, that makes sense actually, because Pathfinder is the feet is like the core mechanic. Feats are the core mechanic of character building. I just wanted to throw off the the D and D. I mean, yeah. <laughs> um, and then the last little bit they. I don't know why leveling up wasn't the last section of part two, but equi- equipment was the last section for whatever reason. Um, the base equipment is fine, uh, but the higher tier equipment, I think actually that stuff looks pretty fun. There's some pretty cool like higher tier equipment. Um, there doesn't appear to be any distinction between like magic items and mundane items. It's just higher tier equipment has magic weapon type abilities attached to it seems to be how it works far as i can tell uh and yeah they're, they're pretty fun um and then in terms of how much uh, equipment, hmm? yeah uh, the equipment needs a serious editing pass uh why do short swords do a d10 I, and why do sabers not do anything at all except a d8 I, like I, I, what, I, what is this come on you're killing me game you're trying, killing i was me. trying to it's avoid- the one thing i was like super excited about I was trying to avoid bringing up that nitpick, but yes. Okay. No, no, I'm going to bring it up because I care a lot about equipment I, and the equipment kind of, it, it works and it's cool, but like, it, yes, it why, needs, it like needs I, a couple passes, but I think it'll be in its final form. I think it will be quite good. It fucking better be. I'm going to be so tiny. Uh, I will say something that I really like about the equipment in this game is all of the different weapons use all of the character traits. It's not just strength or dex. You have weapons that use instinct. You have weapons that use knowledge. You have weapons that use presence, which essentially means you have a weapon that is based off your character's charisma, which is great for like a bard to be like, I'm so chadly. I'm better with my weapon. I love that. Uh, For example, a rapier uses presence, which I think is really fun. So essentially your charisma, because it's a rapier and you're a gentleman doula. Love that. Big fan of that. Um, oh, one other thing. Really? No spears? Like, no spears. <laughs> yeah, like, no what, spears. What the fuck is this? Are you shitting me? I, like, that was a, it was like, oh, oh we, we use a halberd. They are two very different fucking things. And that you was cannot a, tell me uh, that they are the same. I know more than you, silence child. Uh, like, uh, <laughs> uh, that was a weird oversight to not have a spear on the list. I don't know what happened there, but whatever. Um. Oh, I said there's no magic items. I meant there's no magic items in the D&D sense. There are weapons that do magical damage. Because there's physical damage and magical damage are the two damage types in the game. So there are magical think- weapon equipment, but there are not magic items in the D&D sense. They do have some magic items in the D&D sense. Like if you look for the book, well, they have like consumables. potions that do. Yeah, yeah they have potions and consumables. Yeah. But they don't have what I meant is like they don't have like rarity base. Sword. Yeah, there's no. Yeah, there's no like this is a very rare magical item that is very specifically like enchanted or like there's no distinction there. It's just higher tier stuff does that kind of shit. Uh, But yes, there are like there are consumables and there are items which kind of are like wondrous items in D&D. And then there's uh, the other thing is with equipment is uh, for using equipment. You essentially have uh, other stuff you carry. The game just like doesn't care about. Um, But when it comes to like active equipment, you essentially have four slots. You can have two active thingies and then two things on reserve Uh, which is to say you can have a weapon and a piece of armor as your active and then you can have one weapon and one piece of armor in your reserve Uh, and it can also be a pair of weapons so like two daggers counts as one active weapon because it's a a primary hand and an offhand thing uh So that's good. And then you can spend one stress in a fight to like quick swap your weapons. So. Yeah. That's good. Worked fine. Nothing to say there. Yep. It's kind of. Yeah. Also, I noticed that as the tiers go up, you actually get more weapons 
than you had at the lower. Yeah, it's like tiers. a whole other list. Yeah. yeah. Like so like magical yeah, air quotes, magical weapons, powerful weapons, like plus ones yeah. and stuff. Well, but like even more than that, I noticed under the physical weapon chart at tier one, you can get a blunderbuss, which is not in the tier zero chart. And you can but, get sick. knuckle blades and a war scythe. So like as you go up in levels, they also the lists actually get actively bigger. Uh, which that's that's a fun one. Uh, I believe there's also yeah, uh, at tier three you can get a black powder revolver, which is pretty pretty uh, sick. Yeah, or tier two. That was pretty funny. Yeah, yeah. To, to tier two you can get a revolver. I was like, nice. Uh, and like a it, and like there's like some named weapons in there too, which is fun. I don't know. Oh yep, there's a hand cannon in tier three. Swinging rope blade? I don't even what. Oh, like scorpion, I guess. Um, I uh, no, I I think it's supposed to be like, um, I think it's supposed to be like the dagger tail from um, yeah, Prince of Persia. Yeah, like scorpions. Oh, sorry, I should specify. MK one scorpion has a uh, he has a uh, uh, what's it called, Saragama or whatever. One of those. So like the scythe and then the a scythe on a rope nigh, and then oh yeah no no not that no yeah so i like the dagger tail is just a a whip made of blades i think is what that's what they're having it as the swinging rope blade oh i guess not yeah right swinging rope blade i don't know anyway no, th- no it's probably it's probably a rope dart yeah yeah like like scorpion <laughs> rope dart. yes, yes. <laughs> it's this this guy no, I, f- I forgot that it said swinging. I thought I just I heard rope blade and I. I oh, I, oh, OK. I, I see what you're saying. I see. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that is. And then it ends with equipment. Uh, again, weird, weird thing to end that chapter chunk or, or part the part two of the book on. But whatever. Uh, any closeout thoughts? We did a lot of yapping. Uh, we went hmm. real long. <laughs> as I'm now looking down yeah. at the timestamp. Pepe hands. Uh, yep. Yeah. Uh, you get to, you, you know, you get a little something extra this time around. I had a feeling we were going to go uh, on. Overall, very cool. Um, cool, cool game. Interesting. Looking forward to seeing when it's fully finished. Uh, again, may or may not add to my uh, replacements, uh, you know, for, for d and I mean, I said I want to run it, so that's already... I praise. Yeah. <laughs> I'd be willing to give it a try. Yeah, definitely. I don't know if I necessarily want to run it. Like I said, I might want to wait till there's more stuff out for it, but I would at least like like to do a one shot of it. What I was going to say, I think it's good that like even like I know, Josh, you're already wanting to run it. Even like I'm like, I can run a, like a one shot easily with this, like immediately. I mean, they literally gave you an adventure for it. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like, you run that or I'm also like thinking I'm like, man, I can just run that, try and run the Dillian tomb or like Oh, find yeah. another like small one shot and see how it goes yeah yeah i i kind of want to run the i potentially kind of want to run a little adventure the game it's because then they were recorded the, 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 live on twitch that's no. all folks wow <laughs> i'm hilarious Oh, before we log off, uh, hey, we're pushing the hot takes episode four to the week after next so we can yes. finish out Daggerheart. Uh, we will be posting the link to like add your responses if you are so inclined. I know we've got a few people who are already submitting them uh, with that video that comes out next week. No, with the video. Er, yes, yes, he said that right. Yeah. And if you would like to see that link be posted, follow us on Twitter. That's how you do a segue, man. Got him. <laughs> All right, my, my throat is sore. That's what he said, huh?